If I could call Mr. Mark Drakeford, please. Thank you. Ar oedd yn datgan, am faithfant ac yn wir, ac yn cadw'n hai y bydd... And uh, declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. If you could start with giving us your full name, please. It's Mark Drakeford. Mr Drakeford, you have provided a witness statement for the purposes of this module, and we've got that displayed at INQ 30371209. You signed that statement on the 13th of December last year. Are the contents of that statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? They are. You also provided a witness statement for Module 1, and we can see that at INQ 30177804. That's been signed in the usual way with a declaration of truth as well. You also gave evidence in Module 1, and the transcript of that evidence is available on the inquiry website. And you have also provided two further witness statements for Module 2. If we can just identify those, the first we see there, it's INQ 30273747. And then the second, it's INQ 30280190. And those two have been signed with statements of truth. Uh, Mr Drakeford, uh, we're very grateful for the provision of those statements and also your assistance to date. If I can deal first with your background and career, it is uh, very well known that you are the First Minister of Wales. You have been so since December 2018. Before entering politics, you have worked as a probation officer, a youth justice worker and a Bernardo's project leader. Between 1991 and 1995, you lectured in applied social studies at the University College of Swansea, now Swansea University. You then moved to what is now Cardiff University, first as a lecturer and later as a professor of social policy and applied social sciences. Alongside your university lecturing in 2000, you became a special advisor on health and social policy and later served as the head of the First Minister's political office. You then succeeded Rodri Morgan as the Assembly Men Member for Cardiff West when Mr Morgan retired in 2011. In 2013, you were appointed Minister for Health and Social Services, a post you held until May 2016, when you became Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Local Government. You became First Minister and Leader of Welsh <coughs> Labour in 2018. Is, is that all correct? That's all correct. Uh, although you announced on 13th of December last year that you would stand down as First Minister, you remain First Minister until your successor is selected. Is that right? Correct. Uh, Mr Drakeford, your experience is important for a number of areas in this module uh, because in practice you've worked inside the Welsh Government, including a decade in the First Minister's office since the outset of devolution in 2000. You've therefore got a vast knowledge of um, government, how the Welsh Government machine works in practice. You've also been Health Minister and Minister for Local Government, and so are very familiar with the work of the NHS and local government in Wales. You've also, as I've um, spoken about, been Finance Minister. You therefore negotiated the current funding regime in Wales. You therefore understand the complex issues of government and intergovernment finance. And obviously last, and by no means least, as First Minister, you were head of the Welsh Government and so had overall responsibility for Wales's pandemic response and also its engagement with the UK Government and the other devolved administrations. Unsurprisingly, therefore, there is much to cover um, this morning and this afternoon. If I can start, please, with some questions about your role as First Minister and the decision-making structures within the Welsh Government. You say at paragraph 14 of your witness statement that you are primarily responsible for the formulation, development and presentation of Welsh Government policy, and you say that this did not change during the pandemic. Is that right? That would be right. As First Minister, you chair the uh, Welsh Government Cabinet. You describe in your witness statement the Cabinet as the core decision makers, and you say that although the practicalities of ministerial engagement changed with remote working, the essence of collective decision making remained intact throughout the pandemic. Is that right? My approach as First Minister was always to make sure that the decisions we arrived at prior to and during the pandemic were the collective decisions of the whole of the Cabinet. We will look, obviously, at those particular decisions in, in greater detail later this morning and this afternoon. But broadly speaking, so that we know the lie of the land and we know how you approached these issues, were all the momentous decisions, so the decisions, for example, to impose lockdowns, social distancing measures and so on, were those decisions that were made in practice by the Welsh Cabinet or were they 
decisions made by you and infirmed or endorsed later by Cabinet? The decisions were always the decisions of the Cabinet, either made directly in the Cabinet and almost always in that way. Occasionally, and particularly in the very early days, they were made drawing on the clear knowledge of what the Cabinet would have decided because of prior discussion, but made sometimes in a COBRA meeting where I am the only representative of the Welsh Government present. I understand. And um, although, as you've explained, the full Cabinet led on collective decisions um, during the pandemic, individual ministers were required to make decisions within their own portfolio responsibilities. And you make the point, it's paragraph 39 of your witness statement, um, that you expect ministers to exercise portfolio responsibilities themselves, save where, first, a decision requires a cross-government set of resolutions, and secondly, the issues are so significant that it needs to be elevated. Perhaps just to illustrate the point, the closing and reopening of education settings during the pandemic, is that a decision for the Minister for Education or would that be a decision for Cabinet? Well, I think the decision itself rests with the Minister, but given the significance of that decision, it would only ever be made in the full knowledge of what Cabinet colleagues would have uh, contributed to that decision. So it's made by the Minister, but it's made in the context of discussion across the whole of the ministerial team. Although um, the inquiry understands that there were certain structural changes within the Welsh Government during the pandemic, say, for example, the creation of a Director General for COVID-19, and certain people uh, obviously moved positions, in terms of who made the key decisions, am I right that that remained always the, the Welsh Cabinet, as you've explained, with you acting as first among equals, and then individual mi ministers when the decision fell within their portfolio? Yes. To what extent, Mr Drakeford, do you accept personal responsibility for the core decisions taken during the pandemic, as opposed to accepting it on behalf of your administration? Well, no, I, I accept responsibility myself for all the decisions that we made. In the end, I am the First Minister of the Government, and while I am a very um, firm believer in what is called distributed leadership rather than hierarchical leadership. In the end, the decisions that were made in the Cabinet are signed off by me, and in that sense, I am responsible. I'd like to next explore with you some of the legal, technical, structural problems or issues that, that presented themselves um, when liaising and dealing with the UK Government and the other devolved administrations during the pandemic. The inquiry understands that there was an intergovernmental relations review established in March 2018, which ended in uh, January 2022 and reported then. The uh, idea behind that review was to improve intergovernmental structures and ways of working. And we understand that that review has led to a new architecture for intergovernmental working, which I'll, I will come to in due course. I'd like to just start, though, with the arrangements for intergovernmental relations as they stood at the start of the pandemic. Now, uh, starting point is the Memorandum of Understanding, and we've got that uh, at INQ 30256804. Uh, as we can see there, I think the Memorandum was first agreed in 2001, but it was reviewed periodically, <clears throat> and this is dated October 2013. If we can please have a look at page 9, paragraph 23. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so over the page as well. So this recognises that although most contact between the four nations should be carried out at a bilateral or multilateral basis between departments, there nevertheless needs to be some central coordination of the overall relationship. And therefore, the four nations agreed to participate in what was known as the Joint Ministerial Committee, the JMC. Uh, if we can please have a look at page 12, paragraph um, capital A, 1.3. We can see there it was agreed that plenary meetings of the JMC would be held at least once a year. They would consist of the Prime Minister or his <coughs> representative uh, who would chair the meeting. And then you have Scottish, Welsh First Ministers together uh, with ministerial colleagues, Northern Irish First Minister and Deputy First Minister, and then Secretaries of State, the Territorial Secretaries of State. Now, the inquiry has heard evidence that prior to 2019, JMC meetings would generally take place as was envisaged in this Memorandum of Understanding uh, once a year. Is that, is that your understanding? Well, Miley, because I've been involved, as you heard, for so long, uh, I have taken part in different capacities 
in meetings of this sort with every Prime Minister since devolution other than David Cameron. So I started attending these meetings when Tony Blair was Prime Minister, continued under Gordon Brown, and then with uh, Mrs May and her successor. So, yes, and actually they would sometimes happen more frequently than that. And beneath the First Minister and Prime Minister JMCs, they were very active JMCs which brought ministers together around a particular topic. William Haig, when he was Foreign Secretary, for example, put a great deal of energy into the JMC Europe, which brought ministers together in advance of key meetings of the European uh, Council. So underneath the headline, there are other JMCs, and as I became a minister, I participated in those particularly around Brexit. And I think there was, a, there was a JMC meeting on the 19th of December 2018. That was the first meeting you attended as First Minister. It was a meeting attended by the then Prime Minister, um, Theresa May, First Minister of Scotland, and the then head of the Nor Northern Ireland Civil Service in the absence of a Northern Irish executive. Uh, that was the last JMC plenary session before Theresa May resigned in May 2019. And am I right that there were no JMC plenary meetings uh, throughout the pandemic? None. Now, Mr Johnson, um, former Prime Minister, has said in his witness statement to the inquiry in Module 2 that he chose not to meet with the First Ministers of the devolved administrations because, in his view, that would have been optically wrong for fear that this would give a, <coughs> excuse me, a false impression that the UK was a federal state. What, what is your reaction to that statement? Well... I think I shared the reaction of Professor Henderson, who said in her written statement and in her oral evidence that that was one of the most extraordinary statements she had come across in her very long career of academic study in these matters. Uh, as you know, I wrote very regularly to the Prime Minister asking for a predictable series of meetings between the heads of the four nations uh, it had never occurred to me until I read that, that the Prime Minister had turned those requests down, not on practical grounds, which I could understand. You know, these are very busy times and he was a very busy man. But as a matter of policy, he had decided not to meet. And that did seem to me to be an extraordinary decision. Do you consider that Mr Johnson's uh, seemingly deliberate choice not to meet with the devolved administrations had an impact on the Welsh Government's response to the pandemic? I believe it did. I believe there are a series of reasons why it would have been preferable to have held. Not, I was never, my lady, asking for meetings happening you know, every week. Uh, to my mind, at the height of the pandemic, had we met once in a three-week cycle, that would have been sufficient. But I think there are a number of purposes that would have been properly discharged in such a meeting. I think it would, to use the Prime Minister's term, have been optically important for people in Wales and in other parts of the United Kingdom to see the heads of their nations coming together at a moment of such national peril. I think if we had not reached uniform decisions by coming together, we would have reached joint decisions. So the fact that you would be in the same room as others, you might not come to the identical conclusion, but you would all know what everybody else was deciding. I think that would have strengthened arrangements. And even if you hadn't managed to do that, I always thought that the primary reason for coming together was that you would simply understand better what other leaders of the nations were facing in their own areas of responsibility, how they were proposing to address those challenges, the repertoire of different policy levers they may have wished to, to use. And as a result, for example, had I known more about what the First Minister of Northern Ireland was facing and what she was thinking of doing, that would have informed my decisions, and those would have been better decisions as a result of having an insight into what other people in a similar position were facing. And finally, I think regularity of meetings improves trust. And in a pandemic, when things are moving so quickly and sometimes with such difficult moments, trust is a very special commodity. I think if you look at the meetings with Michael Gove, 
by the time we've met weekly for about six weeks, you can just see how the conversation is different, how it flows more freely, how people are franker with one another, because they have become used to being in each other's company and having those sorts of discussions. And I felt that had we been able to do that at the prime ministerial and first ministerial level, we would have had greater trust in that relationship and that would have been a good thing. In the absence of JMC plenary meetings, COBRA was the highest form for interaction between the four UK governments. And we'll obviously come on to specific COBRA meetings in due course. But I want to ask you just some general questions about the Welsh Government's involvement in COBRA. <clears throat> now, COBRA uh, meeting is obviously controlled by the UK Government. This means that the UK Government decides when they are called and whether or not the devolved administrations are, are to be involved. You make a point in paragraph 19 of your Module 2 witness statement you say that the production of papers to be used at COBRA meetings rests exclusively with the UK government. In practice, this meant uh, you did not see COBRA meetings until shortly before the meetings, in fact, took place. D did you feel that you and other Welsh representatives at COBRA meetings were placed at a disadvantage as a result? Well, I want to acknowledge, first of all, that at this point, everybody is working under the most enormous pressure. And there is very little luxury of time for the production of papers or any other preparation for a meeting. But it would undoubtedly be the case in practice that when you arrived at a meeting, and I would be the only Welsh uh, voice often at that table, other UK ministers would already have had a discussion and would already have had access to the information that I might have seen often less than 20 minutes before the meeting began. And in that sense, you are at a disadvantage because you are having to try to grapple very quickly with information that others have had longer to absorb and to think about. The inquiry heard evidence in, in Modules 2 and also in Module um, 2A that concerns were expressed by some within the UK government, perhaps most vocally by Mr Cummings, about including the devolved administrations in, in COBRA. Um, we see Mr Cummings' witness statement to INQ 30273872, paragraph 82, um, we're looking at. The COBRA meetings with the devolved authorities were particularly bad, as Sturgeon immediately briefed everything discussed to the media. They therefore became even more scripted, formulaic and pointless than the normal Cabinet. They were handling meetings rather than the place where issues were really hashed out. So the suggestion obviously being there, made there by Mr Cummings is that there couldn't be an open discussion at COBRA when the devolved administrations were present as things would be leaked to the press. Are you aware at the time that there were these concerns being expressed within the UK government? Well, I would have been aware of uh, anxieties in the UK government, but I would also have known that they could not have pointed to a single example. Now, I sat in JMC after JMC with representatives of the Scottish government sometimes talking about very sensitive matters indeed in relation to Brexit. And there was not a single example that the United Kingdom government could have pointed to where either the Welsh government or the Scottish government put into the public domain information that had been shared with us on a confidential basis. So while I was aware of and to an extent could understand anxieties, I don't think there was an evidential basis for them. On the 13th of March, Mark Sedwell, then Cabinet Secretary, wrote to the uh, then Prime Minister, and we can see that letter at INQ 30182338. If we could have a look at page two, fourth paragraph. What is being proposed to the Prime Minister here is setting up a new rhythm of meetings, <laughs> including a daily 9am <laughs> Prime Minister meeting with a small group of ministers and key advisers. And then if we can go over to... Um, Paragraph 7, straddling pages 2 and 3, thank you. Uh, you will also need to decide how you want to involve the devolved administrations. Instead of inviting them to your 9 o'clock, 9 a.m. meetings, I propose continuing to including them in COBRA, as public service delivery is where their main challenges will be. I would also recommend a regular meeting with First Ministers, either chaired by you or CDL, um, Chancellor Duchy of Lancaster, uh, to update them on the response. Were you aware of this proposal at the, at the time? So this is the 13th of March. No. <clears throat> now, we obviously know during the pandemic, and you've already spoken about the, the calls that you had with Michael Gove, um, and the fact that you were an advocate for a reliable, regular pattern of contact between the four, four nations. Those calls started in June 2020, and 
you describe in your evidence, and you've um, alluded to it in your uh, oral evidence this morning, that those meetings worked well, you say in your written evidence, because all four participants came to the meeting looking to share information, solve problems, and work together on agendas of common concern. And you go on to say, we were not turning up to be told what had already been decided, whether we liked it or not. Uh, is that, a, is that alluding to how you considered, effectively, COBRA to have operated? Well, that, that wouldn't be a fair characteristic of the whole of COBRA, because I took part in COBRA debates, which were genuine debates and where a variety of views were canvassed. But I also definitely took part in COBRA meetings where the decision had already been made in advance of the meeting, and we were essentially involved in order to be told what the outcome would be. But, the, but that wouldn't be the whole story. You say, it's paragraph 164 of your Module 2 witness statement, you describe Mr Gove as a skillful lead minister, but uh, you say he was a centre forward without a team lined up behind him and where the manager was largely absent. Perhaps for those less familiar with football, can you explain what you mean by that? Well, the absent manager was the Prime Minister, because he was never at uh, these meetings or at the table. And while Mr Gove was a senior minister with the responsibility for these matters, whose voice would count in discussions with his colleagues, uh, he has influence rather than the determinative impact which a message from the Prime Minister would have message from the Prime Minister to a Cabinet Minister says, I would like this to happen, is in effect an instruction. Mr Gove picking up the phone would have to say, what do you think? Would this be a good idea? He's, he's a persuader and he's a, he's a skillful persuader, but that's what he is. And that's what I meant. There was a limit to the extent to which he was able to discharge the remit of leading a four-nation approach across the UK government. So would it be right to say that the, that the calls with Mr Gove, whilst, whilst useful, in your view, were not an adequate replacement for meetings with the uh, First Ministers and the Prime Minister during the pandemic? They needed to be supplemented by some additional regularity of contact between First Ministers. I wouldn't expect to meet the Prime Minister every week, uh, and meeting Mr Gove every week was certainly useful. But at certain points in that weekly cycle, a meeting with a Prime Minister would have allowed that head of government impact to have been brought to bear. Turning then briefly to the Secretary of State for Wales, who throughout the pandemic was um, Simon Hart, who the inquiry heard from last week, I think it would be fair to say that you've made some quite pointed criticisms of the role played by um, Mr Hart during the pandemic. You describe him in your Module 2 witness statement as being peripheral to your interaction with the UK government and go on to say that the Secretary of State for Wales perceived his role as scrutinising the Welsh Government, constantly seeking explanations for policy differences and making inappropriate requests to be inserted into devolved decision-making structures and other groups. Now, when those criticisms were put to the Secretary of State for Wales last week, or the, the then Secretary of State for Wales last week, he said that scrutinising and interrogating decisions of the Welsh Government was very much part of his role and that, effectively, the Welsh Government should have been prepared for such scrutiny. Now, do you agree and do you have comments on that evidence? Well, of course, the Welsh Government must be open to scrutiny, but the Welsh Government is scrutinised by the Parliament of Wales, by the Senedd that is directly elected by people in Wales to discharge that responsibility. Well, the Secretary of State for Wales is concerned, again, to try to be as even-handed as I can, where he discharged responsibilities that were his to discharge, he did so effectively. So, my lady, during the uh, progress of the pandemic, as you know, there were points when the Welsh Government sought the assistance of military authorities. And there's a process, the MACA process, military assistance to civil authorities. Uh, the Secretary of State for Wales has a formal part to play in that process, and he always did it perfectly satisfactorily. He was always you know, there when he was needed. He always moved the process along by discharging his responsibility. So where he had a role to play, I've got no complaints about what he did. My difficulty was, particularly in the early days, with, frankly, 
I think, very little else to do. The Secretary of State filled his days by writing letters to me, asking me about the Welsh Government's responsibilities. And um, the, the, the risk was that he was beginning to get in the way of our ability to do the things we needed to do. At one point, I had to write to him and explain that I couldn't go on giving a priority to my scarce officials' time with so many other things to do, to replying to correspondence from him about things for which he had no responsibility and for which I am accountable not to the Secretary of State for Wales at all, but to the Parliament of the Welsh people. Um. Now, one of the roles of the, the Secretary of State for, for Wales is to act uh, as a voice for Wales within the UK Cabinet. Did you consider that Mr Hart uh, acted as a, as a voice for uh, the Welsh Government at UK Cabinet during the pandemic? UK Cabinets have some hierarchical um, implications within them, and the Secretary of State for Wales is not to be found near the top half of, of that hierarchy. Um, I, I'm afraid I would say that the Secretary of State for Wales was far more the voice of the UK government in Wales rather than the voice of Wales in the UK cabinet. Now, you, you've um, mentioned several times in your written evidence and also um, this morning the effectiveness of the approach that Michael Gove took and the meetings that you had with him effectively acting as a, as a key link person between the UK government and the devolved administrations. In, in your view, in the event of a future pandemic, where, where does that leave the territorial offices of the, the Scottish office, the w Wales office, the Northern Irish office? Do, are those offices being made redundant? Do you see them having a different role, uh, or should they have a different role in the event of a future pandemic? Uh, well, um, my lady, this is a much broader question and well above my own responsibilities. Maybe way beyond my terms of reference, by the sounds of it. Shall I just say in general terms that, you know, cases have been made for a territorial office in the UK government, a single Secretary of State with second tier ministers for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. But that's a matter for the Prime Minister of the day, quite definitely not for me. I think, um, Mr Drayford, the reason I ask the question is because we're coming to the intergovernmental reforms that we started off speaking about that were then reported on in January 2022. Um, perhaps if we can just have a look at that report briefly. It's INQ 4083215. Um, this, a couple of other witnesses earlier uh, in the inquiries have been taken to this, and this establishes a new framework, a new set of structures for managing intergovernmental relations. And perhaps briefly we can just have a look at paragraph uh, 11 on page 3. Uh, <clears throat> so the new framework that supersedes the JMC system provides this three-tier committee structure, uh, and all four nations, as I understand it, have agreed to work under these new arrangements. Uh, you, you say at paragraph 201 of your Module 2 witness statement, uh, you make the point that the new intergovernmental arrangements have never been fully implemented, and in any event, you say, they need to be animated by the necessary cooperative spirit for them to take the strain of responding to a prolonged and, pr and profound emergency. So my question is, is simply this. In, in the event of a future pandemic, do you believe that these new arrangements for intergovernmental working will be effective? Well, I think they would be more effective than the ones we had to rely on during the pandemic. They are still very new. They're still not fully tested. The uh, ministerial committee, the top tier of this, didn't meet at all in 2023, hasn't met now for 18 months. So uh, partly that, my lady, is because there has not been an executive in Northern Ireland. So there are sensible reasons why it's been difficult to do so. Uh, but then that's partly what I meant by saying that structures are important and it's important to get them right. But structures by themselves will not be sufficient. There has to be an approach to the structures. There has to be a commitment to them. There has to be a willingness to make the structures work. <laughs> now, all the structures you like on a piece of paper, but if the people involved in them don't, don't approach them in that spirit. They won't deliver what is needed. The, so I think, did, did you, sorry to interrupt. No. Do you want to finish the sentence? No, no, no. Do you understand the structure? Because I confess I find it really 
rather difficult. There's inter interministerial groups, interministerial standing committees, and time limited interministerial committees. Um, not exactly straightforward no. to understand. No, it's it's uh, over complex, uh, I think, and I think that's one of the things we've learnt since uh, the structure came into being. It needs to be streamlined and paired uh, back. Essentially, though, it has three levels. It has ministers meeting on their own portfolio areas. There are two committees then which stand over that, the interministerial standing committees, one dealing with finance, one dealing with other things, and then at the top of this pyramid, a council of ministers which involves the prime minister and the first ministers. Uh, but I, I, I would agree with you. My experience of this so far is it's over-elaborate. I want to next um, ask you, Mr Drakeford, some questions about information sharing between the four nations, particularly the sharing of scientific um, information, and start with some questions about SAGE. Uh, in January and February, the Welsh Government's primary source of scientific and medical information about the virus came from SAGE, and you say at paragraph 30 of your um, witness statement for Module 2, this was a comfort to you at that early stage of the pandemic to know that SAGE would meet regularly. However, as we've seen, the first five SAGE meetings went ahead without any representatives of the Welsh Government. Did that concern you, that those early SAGE meetings going into early February didn't have a Welsh voice around the table? Well, I think there are a number of answers to that. First of all, uh, we were fortunate, and I don't think there's anything more than that, fortunate that our Chief Scientific Officer for Health, Rob Orford, was well known and well connected to people who were on SAGE. So I always felt we had a direct line into the SAGE discussions. As that month moved on, I did come to be more anxious that we had somebody in the room while those discussions were taking place, rather than having a good readout of the discussions, and particularly, and this is slightly later on, anxious about our ability to put questions directly to SAGE that were pertinent to Wales. But in those very early days, it did not occur to me that there was a particularly Welsh angle on what was a global phenomenon. So SAGE in those early days is less concerned with domestic impacts than in collecting the information of what was happening elsewhere in the globe. And at that point, I did not myself see that there was a particularly Welsh angle or contribution to that. So in the beginning, I didn't have uh, concerns. They did grow a little as the weeks went by. The inquiry heard evidence in Module 2 from Professor Henderson that SAGE data and advice had an English frame of reference. From what you've just said, do you, do you agree with that? Well, uh, I, I do agree with it to an extent. Um, the United Kingdom is a voluntary association of four nations, but they're very different in size and scale. So if you have a population of 55 million to draw evidence from, that's always going to provide you with a richer source of evidence than a population of 3 million. So, you know, so in some ways, I don't think we should be surprised that a lot of the information that SAGE has is from the largest nation. However, there were times when there would have been specific dimensions that were pertinent to Wales, where you struggle a bit to see where SAGE was finding the evidence it might have needed to make sure that Welsh circumstances were being taken into account in its deliberations. You identify another issue with, with SAGE at paragraph 30 of your Module 2 witness statement. You say there was no reliable protocol which made it clear that SAGE, in fact, worked for all four nations and not just for England. And you give two reasons for that. First, you say um, you had to ask COBRA to make SAGE advice available to the Welsh Government. And secondly, you could not ask SAGE to carry out any bespoke research without prior agreement from COBRA. Is, is, that, is that right? That is right. Now, the technical advisory cell that was set up on the um, 27th of February and the inquiries heard um, evidence that that was set up because SAGE outputs needed to be interpreted into a Welsh context. <laughs> but given the, the lack of Welsh representation at SAGE, the fact that SAGE papers were not being shared with the Welsh Government until, uh, I think it's early April, 
the limitations on commissioning that you refer to in your witness statement and the, the, Welsh, the lack of Welsh-specific interpretation until you get TAC and TAG set up. Was it the case in January and February that the Welsh Government was not really in a position to question any of the advice that was coming out of SAGE? I don't think we were not in any position because, as I said, our chief scientific uh, advisor in health was well connected to SAGE, able to let us know what was happening and able to ask questions on behalf uh, of Wales. But what I think happens is that the limitations that you uh, enumerated get resolved over the weeks that those issues come to the fore. So today, you would hope that those things would have been in place from the beginning. They weren't, but they were identified and they were resolved. But if you had growing concerns that the um, Welsh-specific features weren't being reflected in SAGE, couldn't you have set up TAC and TAG earlier to get the Welsh-specific focus? I think if, if all this were to happen again, you would hope that TAG and TAG would be there from the beginning. Um, but I think, as I say, these realisations are dawning as the weeks go by and where you begin to realise some of the limitations of your starting point. And then we do set up TAG and TAC, and I was always extremely grateful for the people who provided their time and their expertise to us in that way. And even if we, in the future event, had better representation at SAGE, better access to their information, better ability to ask them to do work for us, I'd still have TAG and TAC. I wouldn't not have them, because I think the job they did in turning that more general information into specific advice for Wales would still be very, very valuable. So as, as well as TAG and TAC being established um, earlier, in the event of a future pandemic, you would be calling for Welsh representatives to be on SAGE from the outset? Uh, to my mind, that will be an important lesson of the experience that we uh, live through. As well as um, SAGE, information about the virus in January and February was obviously being relayed to you and the Welsh Government through participation in COBRA meetings. The <coughs> first three COBRA meetings were 24th of January, 29th of January and the 5th of February. Uh, Welsh Government was represented by uh, Vaughan Gethin in his capacity as Minister of Health and Social Care at those meetings. Uh, those initial COBRA meetings and indeed I think the next two, so the 18th and 26th of February, they were chaired <coughs> by the Secretary of State for Health, um, Mr Hancock, and it's not until uh, the 2nd of March that we see the first meeting being chaired by Mr Johnson. Now, it, it is obviously quite permissible for COBRA not to be chaired by the Prime Minister. Indeed, it can be chaired by any official. You, however, commented in your evidence that there is a clear enough case for concluding that the Prime Minister should have chaired earlier COBRA meetings, but you say not for the purposes of reaching different outcome in terms of the work done by COBRA, but in terms of giving a greater impression that the crisis was being taken seriously. Is that right? Yes. So, my lady, I, I've uh, attended many COBRA meetings, not to do the pandemic at all, but other crises, and it's very ordinary for them to be chaired by the minister with the greatest direct responsibility for them. So... The fact that the Prime Minister was not there at the beginning, I, shouldn't, I don't think people should read that as something extraordinary. But as the pace of concern begins to gather, I think in retrospect you could say that the Prime Minister's involvement in chairing COBRA earlier than he did would have sent a stronger signal about the seriousness with which the gathering storm was being taken. Now, the first COBRA meeting that you attended was um, the 18th of February, so you, you did not attend the first three meetings. I mean, might it be said that your non-attendance at those first three meetings uh, indicated that the unfolding crisis was not being taken uh, seriously by the Welsh Government? Well, I think there are two reasons why I wouldn't um, agree to that proposition. First of all, at that point the approach to the pandemic is still very health-dominated. It's still being dealt with in the Department of Health in London and the 
actions inside the Welsh Government are very much concentrated uh, around our Health Minister as well. So I think a Health Minister going to a COBRA chaired by the Health Minister of the UK Government to talk about health matters is not unreasonable. Uh, and the second point is, of course, is that Vaughan Gethin is a very senior minister in my ministerial team, uh, and I have full confidence uh, that he will represent the Welsh Government and Welsh interests uh, in the fullest extent. Obviously, we, we understand that there would have been discussion in those early COBRA meetings about public health matters, <laughs> and at that stage, the pandemic, um, the virus had not been declared a pandemic, but by mid-January, it had spread to Thailand and Japan. You had UK scientists reporting a 12% hospitalisation rate, and there was already evidence of limited human-to-human -human transmission. So, in an overarching sense, as First Minister, do you not think you should have involved yourself in those early discussions concerning what would have been, on any view, a very worrying virus? I think, as you have said, the discussions were focused on health evidence and health responses. And at that point, I believed that the person best placed to represent the Welsh Government in those discussions was the person with those health responsibilities in the Welsh Government. The COBRA meeting that you, you attended on the 18th of February, if we can just see those minutes, please. It's INQ uh, 4056227. Uh, this was a meeting chaired by the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, Mr Hancock. Uh, can you have a look, please, at page five. The, um, and we see there you, you were dialled in um, as First Minister for Wales. Um, paragraph two on page five, there's an update there on the uh, current situation. Uh, if we can have a look at paragraph three, the next paragraph, please. You're told there's nine positive cases confirmed in the UK. Discussion about repatriation of UK nationals from the um, Diamond Princess cruise ship. If we can go to page six, please, um, para 11. There's a discussion about what legislation would be used to respond to COVID-19. Stated there, um, any bill would be employed on a reasonable worst case scenario. It's not for COVID to decide what, whether to legislate or not. And then if we can just finally go over the page to paragraph 13, there is a legislative policy paper introduced, and the chair, uh, Mr Hancock, emphasised that any bill would cover the four nations of the UK. We can just please have a look at that legislative policy paper. It's INQ 409396. If we can uh, just zoom in on paragraph two, please. It makes clear here that the final decision on what provisions the proposed bill would contain uh, when to introduce it and also its parliamentary handling will be taken by number 10 and the Parliamentary Business and Legislation Committee in light of the latest scientific evidence from SAGE. So just pausing there, this is 18th of February. You understood from the, the outset, um, didn't you, that the choice of legislation pursuant to which emergency powers would be exercised would be a decision for the UK government? That was my very clear uh, impression at that time. And because legislation was to be discussed at that meeting is one of the reasons why I attended it myself, because you're now going beyond the health uh, brief itself. And the fact that the committee would not be able to make those decisions without the Prime Minister being there, I think is another argument for why the Prime Minister might have chaired COBRA a little earlier than he did. Now, we obviously know that the UK government had on its statute books the Civil Contingencies Act 2004, uh, it also had on the statute books the Public Health Control of Disease Act. Um, under the former, so under the Civil Contingencies Act, um, you'd have understood that decisions would be made by the UK government and the Welsh government would act as a Category 1 responder, so effectively implementing decisions made by the UK government, whereas under the Public Health Act, it would be the Welsh government making the actual um, decisions for themselves. And we can agree, can we, that the choice of legislation used to respond to the pandemic, um, that would have huge implications for the devolved administrations and the, and the type of structural response to the pandemic ac across the UK. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you, you say in your um, Module 2 witness statement, it's paragraph 22, your assumption at the 18th of February COBRA meeting, so the minutes that we've just looked at, um, <laughs> was that the response to the COVID-19 would be a UK government response and the decisions would be taken by the UK government. Uh, so your assumption at that time 
was the UK's response would be based essentially on provisions which existed for the introduction of emergency powers under the Civil Contingencies Act. Is that right? That was my uh, assumption at that time. Uh, the legislative response was discussed again at a COBRA meeting on the 26th of February. Um, it was a meeting chaired by uh, Mr Hancock, attended, I think, by Vaughan Gethin and Dr Atherton on behalf of the Welsh Government. Um, you comment on this. We don't need the minutes, but perhaps we can just see um, what you say in your witness statement. It's INQ 30273747, and it's paragraph 23... Uh, thank you very much. You say, my understanding is an emergency coronavirus bill was thus considered to be the legislative vehicle. The discussion around the legislative options was from the viewpoint of the UK government. It was the UK government that exercised the relevant powers in the Civil Contingencies Act. However, my own impression at the time was that the coronavirus bill would mirror the essential scheme of the Civil Contingencies Act and that the primary decision-making power would remain with the UK government to be implemented by the devolved governments. Uh, now, your, your impression in late February was, as you say, that the UK government would be introducing legislation mirroring the essential scheme of the, of the CCA and primary decision-making would remain with the UK government. Did you voice or did you have any concerns about that legislative response to the pandemic at that stage or were you content that that was the appropriate response? Well, Welsh Government officials are engaged in discussions about the bill, so I, I'm not anxious about not having a voice in the uh, in the process. My own impression at the time was that UK Government Minister's primary objection to using the Civil Contingencies Act was that it required them to go to Parliament every seven days in order to renew the powers that they were exercising, and that they felt that that would be overburdensome in the circumstances of a pandemic. So my belief was that in the emergency bill, they would continue to take the suite of powers that the Civil Contingencies Act provided to them, but make them more workable from their point of view. If we can just look at the, um, the next six lines of this same paragraph where it says, I had not anticipated that the UK government would use the health protection legislation as the basis for responding to the pandemic, once that course of action had been determined, it placed an onus on the devolved governments to pass corresponding legislation. And below, I comment further on the unintended consequences of this decision for uh, divergence. Now, w w we'll talk about divergence in decision making and what you describe as unintended consequences of that decision I a bit later. I'd just like to focus on when the decision was taken to legislate using public health powers as opposed to the CCA and the impact that that had on, on Welsh government decision making. And you, you say, uh, we don't need it pulled up, but it's in, I think, your supplementary witness statement for Module 2, uh, Paragraph 4. You say, on or around the 2nd of March, the UK government made the decision not to use the CCA. However, your understanding was that even if the Coronavirus Act would be the legislative vehicle, uh, the UK would be the primary decision maker once the Act had received royal assent. Implementation would be left to the Welsh government. So your, your working assumption hasn't shifted at that stage by the 2nd of March. We then um, skip forward to a COBRA meeting on the 20th of March, and you deal with this at paragraph 52 of your Module 2 witness statement, and you say this, uh, the meeting recommended that the Public Health Act 1984 be used rather than the CCA as the legal basis for government action in responding to the pandemic. And I'm right in saying, aren't I, that that 20th of March COBRA meeting, that was the first time that you were told that public health powers would be um, used to respond to the pandemic. My lady, I do think this is a profoundly important part of the, the debate. And you know, I, I know the dangers of looking retrospectively at these things, but the lack of clarity over the legislative basis for the powers that will be needed continues all the way through March. My belief right up until the 20th of March is that the essential decisions would remain in the hands of the UK government and that devolved governments would be implementers of those decisions. Um, even at the 20th of March, there is further confusion over the next couple of days as to where the ability to exercise public health powers lie. And there is an extraordinary exchange 
of messages between Mr Gove and Mr Hancock on the 30th of May, in which Mr Hancock says, I've seen this submission. Uh, it's disgraceful that lawyers don't understand where these powers lie because public health is not devolved. So here is the Secretary of State for Health in England getting the most basic thing entirely wrong. He has advice from his lawyers, which is correct, that once the decision had been made to use the 1984 powers, then the decisions would move to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland and for ministers in London for, for England, and that we would have an obligation to discharge those responsibilities once they were placed in our hands. But as late as the 30th of May, the Secretary of State gets that entirely wrong uh, in his exchange with Mr Gove. So if we were to look to the future and draw any lessons from the experience, then getting clarity early about the legal basis on which these most profoundly consequential decisions were being made, I, I, I think that's when you work your way through it again, it's pretty alarming that on the 20th of March we are still resolving this. But both, both nations knew that they had Public Health um, Act powers on their own statute books. Just playing devil's advocate, could it not be said that you ought to have been, rather than assuming it would be the CCA or a new bill, but a version of the CCA uh, that would be used as a, the legislative vehicle to respond to the pandemic, should you not have been questioning that as far back as the 18th of February when there was the first discussion about legislative um, response and asking, well, where, where are we? Where is this going? Given that it has such, as you say, a profound impact. Well, I think that would have required quite an imaginative leap on the part of the Welsh Government. Uh, COBRA is constructed on the basis that the CCA lies behind the decisions that it will take, and there was no suggestion at all that this was going to be any different. <coughs> all the discussions about legislation seemed to me to be clearly on the premise that decision-making in a national emergency would lie in the hands of UK ministers. I think it would have been quite you know, a sort of sidestep for the Welsh government to say, uh, but surely there's a different way of doing this, using powers we've already got. And uh, you know, quite clearly that had not occurred to me because the 20th of March is the first point at which I begin to realise that this is a looming reality. You say in your uh, evidence that once the decision had been taken, this was a decision that you agreed with because uh, health is a devolved matter and using public health powers would allow the Welsh Government to respond to Wales's specific circumstances. And you, you go on to say at paragraph 195 of your Module 2 witness statement um, that once the determination was made to rely upon public health powers, the responsibility for decision-making was dispersed to each UK nation, and you believe that this allowed the Welsh Government, in your words, to calibrate a response which reflected our particular circumstances and which sustained the broad support of Welsh citizens. Again, I suppose it's a similar theme to my last question. Um, if you agreed, once the decision had been made and you agreed with the use of public health powers, for all of those reasons you, you explain in your witness statement, why were you not advocating on behalf of Wales for public health powers to be used to respond to a pandemic rather than the CCA or a version of the CCA? Because until the 20th of March, there was no suggestion at all that that was the turn of thinking that the UK government had come to. Once they once they do come to it, uh, maybe I would have changed one word in my own statement when I heard you read it. it. It isn't simply that a decision to use public health powers allows Welsh ministers. It requires Welsh ministers. These now become your responsibilities. You have no option but to exercise them because the responsibility has been placed in your hands. You, coming back to the, the point I said we'd pick up on um, about unintended consequences that you refer to in your witness statement, um, was that something that you thought at the time was appreciated by the UK government? I think that's probably what I meant when I used the word unintended consequences. I don't think it was apparent to UK ministers at the time that by placing that responsibility, 
at the nation level, that meant that there would now be decisions being made by others over which they had no direct control. So I think that was a dawning realisation for UK ministers. You can begin to see it as early as the 23rd of March, though, the decision of COBRA in lockdown, because there are already nuances that are different there. There's a discussion in which the Mayor of London, myself and the First Minister of Scotland are arguing that construction sites ought to be covered by the new arrangements, and the UK Government is taking a different view. So there are already small signs from the very beginning that there would be some differences in implementation, but I think it was a dawning process rather than a clearly plumbed-in recognition from the outset. No. Perhaps, uh, Mr. Jacobford, for some of the reasons that you've just given, um, the inquiry has heard evidence in, in Module 2 from some UK government ministers and former ministers that they regret the decision not to use the Civil Contingencies Act uh, to respond to the pandemic. Um, Mr. Johnson, in his evidence uh, in Module 2, has said that in the event of a future pandemic, the UK should be treated as a single epidemiological unit and that the best approach is a UK-wide one with no differences between the four nations. And that evidence was echoed by um, Simon Hart at, at the end of last week when he gave evidence to, to the same effect. Do you agree that the best approach in the event of a future pandemic is a UK-wide response, or would you um, see a response, as with uh, this pandemic, by using the Public Health Act again? Well, I definitely don't think that the evidence suggests to me that decisions made in London would have been better decisions as far as Wales is concerned. Uh, we are just inevitably closer to the ground, more aware of administrative structures, alert to the different patterns uh, of the disease in the Welsh uh, case, simply better able to communicate in the bilingual way in which Wales uh, operates. So I definitely don't agree that better decisions would have been made from Whitehall than in Wales. I think there is a different way, however, in which strengthened ability to coordinate between the four nations would have been preferable to the pattern uh, that we ended up with, and that that would have allowed uh, a different degree of coordination and joint decision-making that we ended up with. And that's a preferable way, I think. Before we leave the um, question of divergence, you will have been aware that both Mr Johnson and Mr Hart have given evidence to the inquiry um, that there was a risk of the devolved administrations being, in their words, different for the sake of being different. And in fact, Mr Hart arguably went further and stated that the Welsh Government actively sought differentiation for no other reason than to be different and to set Wales apart from the other nations in the UK. Was the need to be different for the sake of being different ever part of your thinking or the thinking of the Welsh Government? Well, I absolutely refute the assertion of the Secretary of State for Wales, for which I notice he provided no evidence at all. Uh, my lady, I am a believer in the United Kingdom. You know, I lead a government that wants the United Kingdom to succeed and faces considerable political opposition from people who believe that Wales is future will be better separated from the United Kingdom. Uh, I had no motivation of any sort to make decisions for the sake of being different. And I think my effort through the whole pandemic is to try and find better ways of coming together to make better informed decisions. And I don't think the Prime Minister or the Secretary of State could offer you a single specific instance to justify the charges that they have made move away now from legislation, devolution, divergence, and ask you some questions about the um, Welsh Government's initial response in the, in the early months of January to, um, January to March 2020. You say in your evidence that although you were aware of COVID-19 in January and February, it was not a priority of the Welsh Government. And you go on to say that as February 2020 moved on, responding to the extreme and adverse weather conditions that caused widespread and significant flooding throughout Wales was, your words, the most urgent matter facing the government. Uh, 
and it wasn't until March that COVID moved up the Welsh Government's priority list until it became the most significant matter. Is that, is that a fair characterisation of the position? Well, the early months of 2020 are dominated from a Welsh Government's perspective by the uh, risks of a no-deal Brexit, which was imminent, by winter pressures in the health service, which are always at their most pressing in early January, in our anxieties to pass a budget through the through the Senate. We are a government with a very slim majority, and you've got to pass a budget. And by the first part of February, we are dealing with very significant 40-year uh, adverse weather events that affect thousands of people. So those are the front-of-desk preoccupations during those early weeks. It is not to say, of course, that we are not aware of uh, what is happening elsewhere in the world or engage in keeping ourselves properly informed about it. My colleague Vaughan Gethin starts issuing weekly statements to the Senate on the 24th of January. He starts issuing daily updates to ministerial colleagues on the 28th of February. Before, 28th of January, I'm sorry, both of those are January dates, 24th and 28th of January. So before February begins, we are already alert to and engaged in making sure we are as well informed as we can be of what's happening elsewhere. But at that point, it is happening elsewhere. There is not a single case uh, in Wales, nothing you can point to that is directly affecting the Welsh population. On the 24th of January, um, you were advised by Dr Atherton that there was a significant risk that the virus would arrive in Wales. That's right, isn't it? Yes. Now, despite that warning being given on the 24th of January, uh, COVID-19 is not discussed by the Welsh Cabinet until the 25th of February. Now, given that Cabinet <coughs> is charged with making, as we've discussed, any of the key decisions relating to pandemic response, is it surprising for there to have been no discussion at Cabinet for more than a month after you're given that warning by the um, Chief Medical Officer about a significant risk of the virus arriving in Wales? I think if I could, my lady, it's just important to provide a small amount of context here. The Welsh Government is a very small government. We have nine Cabinet Ministers. We all work with our offices next door to one another. It's very, very different to Whitehall, where ministers are scattered necessarily across a wide geography, and where the only time they come together is when they're in the cabinet room. The fact that there was no discussion at cabinet until the 25th of February should not be read at all as there being no discussion between cabinet colleagues, because there was a great deal of discussion between cabinet colleagues in the way that we would normally transact business. So I would have spoken directly to Vaughan Gethin after all the COBRA meetings that he had discussed, and he would have been involved in other discussions with Cabinet colleagues. At that point, there is nothing for the Cabinet to decide. We're being kept well informed. We are discussing matters between uh, ourselves. And then there comes a point when it becomes clear that the Cabinet is likely to be involved in cross-portfolio decision-making. At that point, it becomes an item on the Cabinet agenda, and very quickly, it comes to dominate the work of the Cabinet. It isn't the point that it's not just a case of being kept informed. It's a case of making sure that people know what is going to happen on the ground, what preparations there are, um, for example, for shielding vulnerable people, um, to check that there's surge capacity. It, it's not just monitoring. It's the point I made to Vaughan Gethin. It's not just knowing what's going on around the world. It's what are we going to do when it comes here, which there's a significant risk it's going to. So I think the, the question for me there is, at what point does the Cabinet shift from the being kept informed to needing to make decisions that will be necessary in Wales? I think that point does not come for us until the second half of February. Up until then, we are essentially making sure that we are as well informed as we can be, plugged into the knowledge that is available at a UK level. There comes a moment, and it's, you know, it's gathering after that 18th of February COBRA meeting. So I say I attended because I could see 
that we were moving into a situation where legislation was going to affect not just the health minister, but the education minister, the transport minister, and the housing minister. And this was going to become a cross-government uh, preoccupation. And that's when the Cabinet begins to discuss things. Mr Drakeford, you, you had some experience of planning for epidemics as you had to deal with the Ebola outbreak whilst you were health minister. During your time as a special advisor to the first minister, there was a SARS outbreak. I mean, given that experience, did you not think or did you not realise in January 2020 the importance of early action, the rapid scaling up of resources, thinking about infection control measures? And aren't they issues that ought to have been discussed at Cabinet at that stage? Well, <clears throat> the signal to me that we needed to move into that territory was the moment when chief medical officers advised that the risk level to the United Kingdom and to Wales has moved from low to moderate. Right until the point at which the Cabinet uh, begins to discuss things, the advice from our chief medical officers is the risk to Wales is low. And when that is your primary signal, it doesn't read to me like a signal that we need to start mobilising in that purposeful way all the things that, that you listed. When the signal changes, and the signal is now, it's gone from being low to being moderate, that's the point at which the Cabinet does become engaged in exactly that list of considerations. There's a, there's a very plausible case, well, I'm not denying it at all, that that signal should have been read earlier, and that we should have been we should have moved what we were doing some weeks uh, earlier into the year. But the signal wasn't there at the time. At the time, the signal is this is a low risk. You know, it's, not, uh, it's not as pressing or right in front of you as some of the other risks that we are dealing with. But at the point that the risk level rises from low to moderate, you see the Welsh Government gearing itself up, or the Cabinet gearing itself up, to grapple with some of those matters. Eleanor Morgan... Um gave evidence yesterday and, and she said that ha if the Welsh Government were given their time again, we would recognise that we probably should have been making earlier preparations throughout January and February. Do you agree with that? I think I've, I've just said that, that there's a very plausible case for saying that, but that is with the lens of hindsight applied to it. If we knew then what we knew now... Um, there are many things we might have done differently with better knowledge. In the knowledge of the time, we moved when the signal to us uh, suggested to us that that was necessary. The inquiry has heard evidence from various sources. So I'm thinking particularly Professor Sir Chris Whitty. Uh, he told Module 2 that he was under no illusions that the UK was well set up to meet a challenge of a major pandemic because he said he knew investment in healthcare had been suboptimal. He knew that the planned flu plans, such as they were, wouldn't necessarily stand up to the challenges of a coronavirus. And also, he was aware that there was no sophisticated or scaled up test and trace system in contradistinction to some other countries. In general terms, in late January, early February, were you aware of those concerns? Was that a viewpoint you shared in Wales? Well, we would certainly have shared the view that a prolonged period in which the funding of public services was not what it needed to be would have left the system more vulnerable to a sudden and major impact. We would absolutely have understood and shared that. I would certainly have been aware that we did not have a uh, test and trace capacity of the sort that we were uh, eventually able to mobilise. I received advice in the middle of February that Wales had the capacity to carry out 100 tests a day and that in normal circumstances that was you know, sufficient to meet our needs, but it clearly was not going to be sufficient to meet a mass testing regime. So some of the points that uh, the, the CMO for uh, England makes there I think would have been known to us. Just before we move, can I go back? I'm sorry about this, Mr Poole. Can I go back to the advice you were getting, Mr Drakeford? Um, you said that this, your CMO advised you in January of significant risk. I always call significant a weasley word on the basis it can mean a lot of things to different people. But it usually means something to mark significant. Uh, and then you say you're getting advised it was low risk that the... Um, virus was coming to Wales. Did you interrogate that advice and say, well, when, wait a minute, back in January you said it was significant. 
and therefore something that should be marked. And, and now you're saying low. Did you interrogate it? Did you ask questions of why you were getting <coughs> that advice? We certainly have had opportunities to discuss it directly with our chief medical officer. But my understanding at the time would have been the risk to the United Kingdom is low. The chances of it coming here are not significant. If it does come here, then the risk will be significant. That's the distinction, I think, that, that was in my mind. You know, the risk of it happening is not... It's, it's at the low end of the spectrum. If it were to materialise, then the risk will be significant. So I think you, you can understand that the Chief Medical Officer was making two separate but linked points. Can I say that again? Is that, uh, no, no, it's, it's the, the <laughs> distinction between there's a risk of serious rain and a serious risk of rain. Yeah. I would have thought that significant risk means that there is there's a, a, a likelihood or poss very real possibility it's coming. Uh, so it's not a risk of serious rain, it's a serious risk of rain. Well, I, I agree. You can, you can definitely read it that way. Had that been the intention, I would have expected, though, that the Chief Medical Officer would say, and therefore... These are the things you need to be doing now. And there wasn't advice of that sort, either through Sir Chris Whitty or through other chief medical officers or in, or in Wales at that point. So I think had the chief medical officer meant ministers to understand this is coming and it's coming your way and you need, they would have been, and you need to do this. But there wasn't. And so I think that what he, what he meant was the risk is low. That's what we're being told. If it happens, it will be significant. And that was accepted without interrogation? Um, not with, I wouldn't say without interrogation, because we would have had an opportunity to discuss it. But the fact that it was unanimously the view, had that been an idiosyncratic view of the Welsh CMO, then you would have expected quite a lot of interrogation, given that he is mirroring the advice that all his fellow chief CMOs are giving in every part of the United Kingdom. I don't think you would have thought that they were major alarm bells being sounded. Mr Drakeford, as well as <clears throat> assessing risk, one also has to assess likely harms. And given the demogra demographic characteristics of the Welsh population, so specifically the age profile of those aged over 65 and aged over 75, would you agree it was always likely that Wales would experience disproportionate levels of impact from COVID-19? Well, um, as we say, you know, Wales, older, poorer, sicker. Uh, so, yes, of course, that would always have been in the mind of Welsh ministers. Health inequalities has been a preoccupation uh, of uh, Welsh ministers throughout the whole of the devolution period. So we would have been aware, of course, of that. So even if the risk um, is low, the harm levels, given what you say older, poorer, they are higher. Doesn't that speak to taking earlier action? I don't think that's an unfair point to make, whether by itself it would have been enough to um, make Wales what would have been an outlier in the preparations that were being made across the United Kingdom. I'm not sure that it bears that much weight. And I think, in fairness to you, you, you do say in paragraph 17 of your Module 2 witness statement, you say, looking back on matters and given what we now know, there is strong evidence to suggest that more stringent action could have and should have been taken sooner. I just want to um, explore with you briefly before we take a break what stringent action you think ought to have been taken um, by the Welsh Government in January and February. And if I can just start uh, with the Emergency Coordination Centre, Wales. Um, the inquiry has heard evidence from Dr Quentin Sandifer. Um, he was, between January and November 2020, the lead strategic director in public health Wales uh, for COVID-19. He's told the inquiry that on 22nd of January, he invoked the public health Wales emergency response plan at enhanced level. And then two days later, on the 24th of January, so coincidentally the same day that you have a conversation with the CMO and are advised of a significant risk of the virus arriving in Wales, uh, the Public Health Wales called on the Welsh Government to stand up the Emergency Coordination Centre. Uh, he received a response from David Goulding, uh, who said, I don't see this event as it is currently moving from being in the public health outbreak management space and into the civil contingency multi-agency emergency response. 
Uh, and then that position was restated by the Welsh Government on the 3rd of March in, in an email um, to Public Health Wales. Dr um, Sandifer then spoke to, on the 11th of March, the date that the WHO declare COVID-19 a pandemic, the fact that Public Health Wales drafted a paper summarising the current situation in Wales and providing effectively an evidential summary of considerations that the Welsh Government uh, could take into account in deciding whether to declare a major incident for health in Wales. And Dr Sandover told the inquiry, uh, feedback to that paper was that such a declaration would not be helpful. And he said he was astonished uh, that by early March, the Welsh Government were not treating the pandemic as a civil emergency situation. Looking back, is that something that you would do differently? Well, I think the first thing I have to say is that I would not have been aware of any of those conversations. Those are going on between officials who are themselves experts in the Welsh response to an emergency. Um, I cannot rule out the possibility that had the Public Health Wales view been more directly communicated to ministers that that would have made a difference to uh, the actions that uh, we took. But the system that we had, as you know, is that the Public Health Wales does not speak directly to ministers by routine. They speak to Welsh ministers via the Chief Medical Officer, who is the person charged with the oversight of the Public Health Wales functions. So I, I can't uh, rule out, of course, that had those views come to us in the way that Dr Sandifer described, it might have made a difference, but that isn't the way that they were conveyed. Dr Sandifer says that what he thinks was missing was national strategic leadership and coordination from the Welsh Government. Is that a fair criticism? And he's talking specifically the period January to mid-February. Uh, no, I don't think it is. Dr Sandifer, uh, who I've worked with many over many years and have a great deal of uh, respect for, does not work in the Welsh Government. Uh, the fact that he is unable to see something happening does not mean that it is not happening. It just means that from the vantage point he has in Public Health Wales, an arm's length body that operates outside the Welsh Government, there were things going on that he didn't know about. I if that's an appropriate yes, point of course, certainly. Um, as you know, Mr Drakeford, we take regular breaks. I know I'm very conscious of all your other duties, and I promise you we will complete your evidence today. I'm sorry okay. about the demands no, on your time. Not at all. Uh, half past 11, please. All rise. Mr Drakeford, if we could start, please, with the 25th February Cabinet meeting. We can see the uh, minutes at 00129852. Uh, as we discussed earlier, this is the, the first Cabinet meeting to formally discuss COVID. If we can go to the last page, it's page six, uh, uh, under any other business. Um, we were told by Mr Gethin we shouldn't read much, if anything, into that. Um, 5.3, please. Uh, Mr Gethin is um, leading and, and addressing Cabinet at this stage. Uh, the, this paragraph was discussed um, at quite some length with Mr Gethin when he gave his evidence. Uh, do you have an independent recollection of what was said about um, there being imported cases into the UK or imported cases into Wales? I appreciate we are going back four years. Well, the minute is inaccurate. It doesn't reflect what was said at the Cabinet. As you know, sometime later, before the minutes are published, I get sent them. I'm afraid nailing my reputation for pedantry to the wall, I read them and go back in and say, I'm sure that minute is inaccurate. That's not what was said. And the minute is corrected. You, just to clear this up as well, you, you do deal with this in your um, witness statement for this module. It's INQ 3037209. At page 25, paragraph 77, uh, you, you say there um, it was noted that the Minister of Health and Social Services had been updating um, uh, Senate members. The risk to the UK was described as moderate. Um, information was shared across all four um, 
travel advice, public, so four lines up from the bottom, there had been no imported cases into the UK. So that, that error from the minutes has crept into your witness statement. Yes, um, yes. That, that is also an, an error, is that yes, right? Yes, it is. What is perhaps striking about these minutes is that the, um, and perhaps if we just go back to them, it's INQ 3012 please, is there's no consideration by Cabinet of what steps should be taken to stop the virus spreading. So what infection control measures needed to be thought about and put in place? Um, there doesn't seem to be any discussion about that. Why, why is that? I'm not sure that I can uh, recollect for you precisely enough why some things were discussed and why some things were not at that moment. For me, the key thing is, is that this is the moment at which the Welsh Government's attention turns to this issue with the significance that it was to command. And at that point, all those issues are being discussed. Uh, well, if I could say, just in terms of the Welsh Cabinet's response, at this point, I decide that all Cabinet meetings should now be attended by all ministers, not just Cabinet ministers. There are 12 ministers in the Welsh Government, four of whom are junior ministers. But I want everybody around the table from now on. By the 4th of March, we are setting up a second meeting every week for all Cabinet colleagues specifically and only to deal with uh, the COVID-19 emergency. So very rapidly from this moment on, the Welsh Government is gearing itself to deal with the issues that Mr Poole has identified. Mr Draper, what, what was the plan at this stage? This is the 25th of February. It's being, COVID is being discussed for the first time at Cabinet. What was the plan for practically stopping the spread of the virus into Wales, the, the nuts and bolts of the plan as you understood it to be? You've spoken about testing and tracing. We know that that only dealt with index cases. Uh, what, what was the Welsh Government going to do about infection control measures? That's, that's why I say I'm surprised that that's not seen in these Cabinet minutes. And I just want to know, what, what was the plan at this stage? Well, first of all, to be clear, there is no plan to prevent the virus from spreading into Wales. That would have been uh, an ambition well beyond what you would have imagined we could have accomplished. But from now on, there are very practical things being discussed about how we would respond to coronavirus when it arrives. And it's now becoming a when rather than an if. So you will see measures being taken. We have an early discussion about schools and what we will do with that. We are beginning now to think about how we will gear the health service up for what it may face. And within another few days, and only a few days, and as the only part of the United Kingdom at that point, we formally agree that we will postpone all non-urgent outpatient, inpatient treatments in order for the health service to gear itself up for what is coming its way. So. Um, I, I'm afraid I, I just don't have a detailed enough recollection to be able to pinpoint for you, you know, at exactly what point we discuss an exact theme in preparation, but I'm very confident that from that date onwards, all of that is happening. And we'll, we'll work our way through um, March and, and look at some um, minutes as well to, to help your recollection in a moment. Just a step to one side. Um, you say in your witness statement, it's your witness statement for this module, paragraph 82, you say that during the period January to March 2020, understanding of the essential features of the virus was in many ways rudimentary. You go on to say that the Welsh Government's understanding was no better but no worse than any other. And then you go on to say at paragraph 83 that during January and February there was some limited and preliminary evidence which suggested the possibility of asymptomatic spread but that the Welsh Government concluded that there was insufficient evidence upon which to base operational decisions. And this has been a topic that's been explored with various witnesses uh, over the course of the last couple of weeks. The inquiry heard evidence from Mr Hancock in Module 2 that his single greatest regret was not pushing harder for asymptomatic transmission to be the baseline assumption. Is that, so, is that a regret that you share? Well, well I, I have a slightly different regret, I think, to Mr Hancock, which is that I wish we had known more at that point about the scale at which asymptomatic spread would happen. 
Uh, but we didn't have it. Nobody had it. The World Health Organization is still saying in July that it is unclear the role that asymptomatic spread uh, is playing in the coronavirus epidemic. And in February and into March, they are very tentative and very, with very limited evidence suggestions that asymptomatic spread may be playing some unspecified part in transmission. Now, I wish we'd had better information than that, but I'm not sure that I share Mr Hancock's regret that we didn't act more decisively on evidence that was as thin and as unreliable as it was at the time. Given the risks presented to some of the most vulnerable in Welsh society, do you think the risk of asymptomatic transmission was sufficiently factored into Welsh Government decision-making in this period, January to March? And I suppose the question is, I hear what you say about um, there being some evidence, but not no definitive evidence. Ought a more precautionary approach have been taken in any event? Well, knowing what we know now, the answer to that would be definitely. Did the evidence at the time amount to sufficient to take even that more precautionary approach? Well, that question was very directly addressed by our clinical advisers, and as late as the 28th of April, they are telling us that it doesn't. Ask some questions next before we move into March 2020, just about data and, and modelling. Um, We've heard evidence that it wasn't until summer of 2020 that Wales had its own scientific models, and prior to then, modelling output was produced by Professor Ferguson at Imperial University and also SPY-M uh, via SAGE. When those early models uh, reached Wales, the conclusions about MPI effectiveness were not adjusted for, for example, Wales's particular demographic makeup, its geography, the movement patterns of people who lived there, and also the different relationship that Welsh people might have with their government, so likely compliance with any measures put in place. And I, I certainly mean no criticism by raising this, but were you aware that the conclusions that were being made about NPIs would be most effective, and whether they were most effective, weren't being robustly challenged or amended by Dr Atherton or Dr Orford, because they simply didn't have the uh, data or the modelling to make those challenges? Well, they didn't have the, uh, the data or the modelling. That is uh, certainly the case. Uh, I think the inhibition on them fine-tuning what the NPIs might have been in Wales, though, is more practical than that. It's what could the fine-tuning have been? What, what in practice could you have done? Because the NPIs that are available to you are inevitably blunt instruments, and you're you are introducing them at a population-wide level. So I think, I think what I'm struggling to think of immediately is, even if you had calibrated in the way that you are suggesting, even if you had the data to allow you to do it, what would the practical change have been? I, and I don't think I can immediately think of one. I suppose what you, what you could have done as First Minister, and, and you may say you, you did do this, is you look at what was happening all over the world. So. Did you look at South Korea, Japan, what we know happened later in Lombardy, and think that there might be lessons to be learnt there about quick, decisive imposition of MPIs? Well, one of the things I think we were, uh, again, fortunate with, there are some things we don't have, specific data and modelling, but one of the things that Public Health Wales was always good at was international experience. I remember the Chief Medical Officer reporting to me very early on in the pandemic a direct discussion <coughs> that he had had with colleagues in South Korea and that that had been mediated through Public Health Wales on their international uh, links. So I felt we were in possession of good advice from our clinicians on what was happening elsewhere and where you might be able to draw some lessons from it. They are truthfully not easy lessons to draw. The cultural context of South Korea is very different to the cultural context of the valleys of South Wales, for example. So the idea that you could pick up something that was done there and just drop it into the Welsh context, I don't think it was ever going to be as simple as that. But we were, 
uh, I thought, well served by our ability to know what was happening elsewhere in the world and what other governments were trying to implement. If we move back to the chronology, we'd moved our way through February and moving into March now, which uh, you've said in your evidence that's when COVID moved up uh, the Welsh Government's priority list and became the most significant matter. Are you able to help us understand when would you say that day came? Because the inquiry has heard evidence from various witnesses that it wasn't, in their view, until mid-March that the Welsh Government actually could be seen to be taking COVID seriously. Well, I, I would probably put it a little earlier than that, because I'm in the very centre of these things, so I am seeing all the things that are, are happening, and not everybody will have that same perspective. Um, if I had to choose a date, and there's an arbitrary nature to this, isn't there? Probably the 4th of March, uh, I would say, because by the 4th of March, as I say, we are now meeting every week as a cabinet specifically on this uh, matter, so our core group is established. There's a note you'll have seen where the health minister says to his office, clear my diary for the whole of March so that I can focus exclusively on coronavirus. So I think it's a bit earlier than the middle of March. Uh, I put it a, a week or so before that. You attended a COBRA meeting on the 2nd of March. That was the, the first COBRA that was chaired by Mr Johnson. And we can see the minutes there. They're INQ 40056217. If we can have a look, please, at page five, second paragraph. Uh, the chair invited the uh, government CMO and the government uh, CSA to provide a situation update. Uh, there was no sustained community transmission. Uh, so this is sorry, you're quite right, um, and an important correction. I'm missing knots, <laughs> and now we've got a. There was now sustained community transmission. So this is now second <coughs> March. It's nearly a week since uh, COVID has first been discussed by the Welsh Cabinet. We know it's 10 days after lockdown has been imposed in northern Italy. Cases in the UK since late January. You've had the first confirmed case in Wales on the 28th of February. And COBRA is now being told that there is um, sustained community transmission. Mr Drakeford, did you understand at this point, uh, 2nd of March, that containment of the virus had effectively been, been lost? The virus was here, the virus was spreading. I see, sir, uh, Chris Whitty says to the inquiry that he didn't believe that we had reached that point in the second half of February. But I think this is the point at which that move down the down the, the steps of contain, delay, and so on. This is the point at which delay become contain becomes delay. If we can um, have a look please at uh, fifth page, paragraph three. Oh, so same page, thank you. Uh, so continuing, the CMO said that interventions to, del to delay the spread of the virus must not be implemented too early in order to ensure maximum effectiveness. What, what was your position in relation to this suggestion? Was, was there a debate about the good sense or otherwise of, of delaying? <coughs> well, um, my lady, I'm a, I'm a social scientist. That's how I earned my living. So I am, uh, while I'm not in any way uh, an expert in clinical matters. When it comes to behavioural science, you know, it's, it's the stuff that I am familiar with. So I completely could see why there was the debate going on as to at what point do you introduce restrictions, at what point will these become things that the public will understand, that people will be uh, willing to comply with. And the advice that we were getting, and it was pretty consistent advice at this point from the CMO, from behavioural scientists is, if you go too soon, you may lose the impact that you're looking for because people won't be convinced, they won't see it in their own lives, why it is they're being asked to do these extraordinary things. And the compliance may not follow at the level that you need. So um, I'm, this, is, this is part of the debate which I've, I felt I was on stronger grounds myself in being able to understand. Again, what we, what we see... Or what we don't see in these minutes, similarly to what we didn't see in the um, minutes from the 25th of February Welsh Cabinet meeting, we don't see any debate about the merit or efficacy of specific measures to, to control infection. Why at this stage, given what you've said about your understanding that um, containment probably had been lost at this point, why is no one saying to the CMO that, look, it's, it's obvious containment's been lost or is about to be lost, 
this fatal virus to which we have no vaccine or antiviral, it's here, it's spreading. What is it in practical terms that needs to be done or what we should be doing now to prevent the spread of the virus or slow the spread of the virus? That all seems to be missing or not debated by COBRA, at, certainly at this point in time. Is that, is that your understanding? Well, of course, I, I don't have the minutes in front of me and they were a, a series of meetings at this point. But this is the point, isn't it, when COBRA is informed that SAGE is debating the different NPIs. It doesn't yet have a sense of which of the potential repertoire are likely to be the most effective, and it doesn't have a sense of the different combinations. You know, the different ingredients on this menu can be put together in different ways, and SAGE doesn't yet know which ingredients we should use and what combination we should use. So that work is going on in SAGE. That's what COBRA is told, and we'll get advice as soon as you know, <coughs> the people who are focusing on this with the best ability to offer us that advice are in a position to do that. And I think if we look at page six, the, um, the end of this, these minutes, next steps, it says, summing up, the chair said, uh, so I think page, page six of these minutes, thank you very much, um, power 14, next step, summing up, the chair said, the government's response must be guided by the science and protecting the vulnerable. So this, this is effectively wait, waiting, waiting on SAGE to inform them of um, what could be done. That, that's that final. I, I I think it's either this meeting or the one on the fourth, where uh, the chair has just summed up a bit earlier in saying it's business as usual. So uh, you know, I I think I do need to make that point if I could. That you know, the prime minister's view, and he expresses it routinely in March, is that we must carry on. You know, we must tell people this is a mild illness. They're not to get. Uh, anxious about it, and that does create a certain inhibition on some of the advice being taken as seriously as I think it was being proposed to us. First Ministers of Wales and Scotland being inhibited by the Prime Minister's view. Um, Mr Drakeford? It, it, when a Prime Minister expresses a view, most people take, you know, they will, it will be taken seriously. I mean, I wouldn't have agreed with him at that point, but he did, he repeatedly, every time we discussed it, so, you know, said things that were designed to minimise the seriousness of the position we were, we were facing and to, I mean, you know, he, he would, he might say that he was responding to that advice about not going too early, not doing, not, not doing things in advance of where public opinion lay, but I think he has said himself, hasn't he, in some of his evidence that looking back, he wasn't taking it as seriously as it needed to be. Accepting the point about um, that some say that not going too early, although I think there may be debates about that. Um, so you're waiting on Sage to come up with the various, the, the modelling of the various interventions, shielding, face masks, all the different closure schools, that kind of thing. Were you aware what work was going on so that should the modellers say, you need this range of interventions, you need to shield the vulnerable, you need to um, test and trace. What work was going on to make sure that once you'd got the recommended combination of NPIs from SAGE, that basically you could then say, right, we're, we'll, we'll, we're on it. We're, we'll get it all ready so that the Welsh people can be as best protected as possible. What work was, I mean, I, to be honest, I've heard a lot throughout the inquiry, not just this module, plans and discussions and I want to know what was actually happening to make things ready. Did, were you aware at that stage or had you left it to your health minister? No, no. Uh, we'd have been discussing all of this in our, uh, in our cabinet discussions. I think the point that I will probably make is that it wouldn't be a reflection of the realities of the time to regard these things as happening in sequence. It wasn't an orderly, we will think, we will plan, we will prepare, we will do. We're thinking, planning and doing all at the same time. So <coughs> in just very few weeks, by the time we get less than three weeks from this point in Wales, all schools are closed, all FE colleges are closed, most major events have been 
cancelled, pubs, clubs and restaurants are closed, gyms, cinemas, theatres, leisure centres are closed, footpaths, beauty spots, tourist attractions and caravan parks are closed. The, it's, it, the, the reality of the time is not a, were you planning, were you preparing before you do? You're having to do everything you know, in, in one very, very compressed uh, sequence of events. And actually, in a very, very short period of time, many of the things that we were thinking about on the 2nd of March have actually happened. And that, that's only possible because people are thinking and preparing and planning and talking particularly, while at the same time getting on and doing things as well. At your regular Monday press briefing on the 2nd of March, that's the first mention of COVID, um, we can have a look at INQ 30227479. Uh, second bullet point, you confirm the first case in Wales, person being treated at Royal Free Hospital in London. And then if we can zoom out and look at under preparations, uh, you say that Wales and the whole of the UK is well prepared for these type of incidents and that you have robust infection control measures in place. Now, isn't the reality that Wales was, was not at all well prepared? I mean, that much was accepted by Mr Gethin in his evidence that he gave in Module uh, 1 and to some extent in his evidence that we heard on, on Monday. For what we actually faced, we were not as well prepared as we needed to be. For what we thought we would face, what we had planned, or planned response, then it did have a lot of robust elements in it. It is simply that when we came to implement the plan, the I'm, 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 I'm very allergic to some of the military metaphors that others used in all of this, but if I use one briefly now, you know, the, the enemy we faced was not the enemy we were expecting. If we can have a look at a, uh, the next COBRA meeting, it's the 9th of March, we've got those minutes, INQ 4056219. Uh, this was chaired by the Prime Minister. You dialed in with Mr Gethin and Dr Atherton. I think it would be right to say the main purpose of this uh, meeting was to discuss delaying the peak of the virus. If we can have a look at paragraph 7 on page 5, please. Uh, so the meeting highlights uh, for the first time that the spread of COVID-19 in the devolved administrations was not at the same stage as England, therefore necessary to consider whether implementation of the response should be staged or uniformly implemented. And although... It's obviously right to say that Wales was behind the curve uh, at this point in time. Your view was that a single message was preferable. Is that right? It is. Now, you, you make a point in your witness statement that the Cabinet Office minutes, which are these minutes that we're looking at, don't accurately record a concern that was raised at the, this meeting by yourself and also the First Minister of Scotland. Uh, the concern was that the Prime Minister and the UK Government appeared to be moving away from reliance on the medical and scientific advice. If I can just summarise, hopefully accurately, the point, and then you can confirm if, I, if I've got it right. Um, sage advice for this COVID meeting defined symptomatic as those exhibiting mild respiratory symptoms. And that advice accorded with the advice that also had been given by Sir Chris Whitty. And the advice from SAGE was that those with mild symptoms should self-isolate and stay at home. However, if we look at um, paragraph six on page five of these minutes, the Prime Minister's summary there states that those with heavy respiratory tract infections were to remain at home, and it would only be the next stage where those with mild symptoms would be told to self-isolate. We don't need to have them up, but there is a Welsh Government uh, note of this meeting, and that records the First Minister of Scotland stating that the Prime Minister's summary did not correlate with the SAGE papers, it was important for there to be a joint agreed CMO advice if there was to be a change of options. Have I, have I accurately summarised the position? You have. Um, SAGE and CMO advice was also to consider household isolation that week. Um, but I think I'm right in saying the UK government thought that that was the least practical option and had the most disproportionate impacts. And you challenged the Prime Minister on this and expressed the view that if the scientific and medical advice was not going to be followed, there had to be a clear, uh, you had to be clear effectively with the public that that was the case. Is, is that right? Yeah, no, that, that is absolutely right. Uh, I just want to um, 
express one nuanced difference. Uh, I've been asked a number of times this morning, you know, did you interrogate the advice? Did you ask about it? Um, I don't, I myself would not use, maybe you didn't intend it, uh, pejorative language about having a robust discussion in, say, in, in COBRA. That's what they're there for. And yes, you know, both the First Minister of Scotland and I felt that we'd gone into the meeting <laughs> with a very clear understanding that the advice we were getting, the advice we would follow would be that people would be asked to self-isolate on mild symptoms. At the meeting, the Prime Minister would not use the word mild. Uh, he wanted to use a different threshold for self-isolation. And we have a challenging conversation about it, but that's what we were there to do. Was the impression you got, though, at this SAGE meeting that this was an instance, perhaps, of the UK government um, and the Prime Minister not following the science? Well, it's a gradation. The science is, is that people should self-isolate. He agreed with that. It's the threshold at which they are to self-isolate that he wished to take a different view. I myself, I'm sure I was guilty of it many times, but I tried to avoid using the phrase following the science. What we were is informed by the science, and then we, we made the decision. And you know, the Prime Minister was probably entitled to have that debate, but he wasn't. You know, he, was, he was not advocating an outcome from that meeting, which is the outcome that I believed at the start. When I went in through the door, I didn't think that's what we were being asked to agree. And it turned out that we were, and that's why we both said, in that case, we need a further advice from all CMOs to, you know, to tell us whether or not they think we are doing the right thing here. Following the, the chronology, but dealing with a discrete topic that fits in now, which is mass gatherings, um, two days after that COBRA meeting, so now the 11th of March, you attended the COVID-19 core group meeting. Uh, there was an update from Dr Atherton. Uh, there was now 15 cases in Wales with some community transmission. And uh, given the events in Italy, there was a need to prepare, he told you, for the reasonable worst-case scenario. Uh, Dr Orford provided a technical briefing on, on mass gatherings and behavioural and social interventions. It's INQ 30271613. Uh, if we can just have a look at the first paragraph, please. So, in the event of a severe epidemic, the NHS will be unable to meet all demands placed on it. Reasonable, uh, in the reasonable worst-case scenario, demand on beds is likely to overtake supply well before the peak is reached. <laughs> Currently, the reasonable worst case is also considered within the bounds of a late likely scenario. If we can have a look, please, at uh, second page, paragraph 7. Uh, being told here that as of uh, 10th of March... Uh, 17 patients in intensive care, likely to increase to 100 within the next 10 days, then 300 shortly after. Exponential growth. Um, paragraph 8, please. Reproduction um, rate currently 2.4, needed to be brought uh, below 1. And then if we can go to the bottom of page 2, uh, please. There's a discussion about behavioural control measures. So restrictions of mass gatherings would likely reduce infection-related deaths by 2%, <coughs> whereas self-isolation of those with symptoms would have a greater impact, likely reduce deaths by 11%. And then if we go over the page to paragraph 12, uh, you're told that any of the measures listed below could on their own potentially flatten and extend the peak of the epidemic by some degree, uh, but a combination was expected to have a greater uh, impact. So... Following this briefing, this is the 11th of March, you knew there was exponential growth in infection numbers. Uh, urgent action was required to control the spread of the virus and stop the NHS in Wales being overwhelmed, also re obviously reduce the number of deaths. Uh, there was then a COBRA meeting on the 12th of March. If we can have a look at the minutes, please. It's INQ 4056221. Uh, if we have a look, please, at page 5, uh, first paragraph. Government Chief Scientific Advisor provides an update. Uh, uh, number of cases in the UK increasing. Uh, numbers would increase quickly. And then SAGE advice was the UK was approximately four weeks behind Italy, expected the UK to follow a similar trajectory in terms of number of cases. Uh, then if we can please skip to paragraph five. Um, 
the third bullet point notes that the hardest intervention to call was whether to cancel mass gatherings, as the evidence was not there, especially for indoor, uh, sorry, especially for outdoor events. Uh, just pausing there. Although the scientific advice was not there, as it says here, to cancel mass gatherings, you'd been advised the previous day that restricting mass gatherings could reduce infection-related deaths by, by 2%. That's right, isn't it? Yes. Um, and I think you, you say in your witness statement that mass gatherings were, in your view, you say, an unwelcomed distraction for the emergency services in Wales. That, that's also right, isn't it? That is it? right. And you also say that you were significantly concerned because of the need for consistent, uh, consistency of public messaging and felt strongly that to say on one hand, stay at home, but on another to say it was fine to attend the Cheltenham Festival or a concert was confusing. That, that's also right. I argued at this COBRA meeting for us to agree that mass gathering should not go ahead. Uh, I argued that strongly as I could in this meeting. I think I said in an earlier answer to Mr Poole that some COBRA uh, decisions you felt had more or less been made before you got there, others there was a more uh, free-flowing discussion. And I remember this discussion uh, particularly well, for a reason I'll say in just a moment. And in this discussion, the Prime Minister, in my view, did go round the room. He took views from anybody who wanted to contribute. He took views from people who were attending remotely. It was a proper discussion, and in the discussion, I was arguing for a four-nation agreement that mass gatherings would not go ahead, not on clinical grounds. I can't do that because all the clinical advice I have is that that's not, not a supported course of action, but I am arguing for it on the grounds of messaging. It seemed to me we're trying to convey to people how serious the position is, and we're, trying to, we're asking them to do some already, some extraordinary things. To say that it's all right to go to a mass gathering seemed to me to contradict that, and my argument was we should all agree that they won't go ahead. The reason I have such a vivid memory of it is that having gone round the table, the Prime Minister summed up against that course of action, and he summed it up by saying, Dom says no. That was his final uh, contribution. I did not know who Dom was at this point, but that was the final thing that the Prime Minister said, and that was the decision that we were not going to go ahead in that way. But my argument, and I made it as strongly as I could, was that on public messaging grounds, that was the right thing to do. And you, you, you weren't alone, though, Mr Drakeford, were you? Because the Scottish Government um, were in favour of advising against gatherings of more than 500 people. If we can have a look at um, page six of these minutes, I think it's the ninth bullet point, says here, Scottish Government minded to advise against gatherings of more than 500 people so as to ensure frontline emergency workers were able to prioritise the response to the pandemic. And then we have a look at the conclusions. It's page eight, uh, para 15. And as you've just told us, the UK government took the decision not to prohibit mass gatherings, but it is noted that the PM respects the Scottish government's decision to cancel mass gatherings to manage pressure on emergency responders. So why didn't you, why didn't you follow the Scottish government and take a decision on behalf of the Welsh government uh, to either ban or, if, as we've heard some evidence, the thinking was there wasn't a legal power to ban, to at least advise against mass gatherings going ahead? Well, two reasons. Because I would not have been able to adduce any clinical evidence in support of that. But secondly, because of the final sentence in the extract that's in front of us here, it was crucial for the government to stick to the SAGE advice, and the SAGE advice did not support banning mass gatherings. And the four nations <laughs> should try to stick together as one United Kingdom. Now, as we know, this was um, there was a Six Nations rugby match to be played between so Wales and Scotland, due to be played in Cardiff um, the following weekend. On the 11th of March, the inquiry has seen evidence from Gareth Davies, the, the then chairman of the Welsh Rugby Union. Uh, he says that he contacted your office to express his concerns about that match going ahead. Um, you, you presume, were you aware of those concerns being expressed by the WRU at that time? 
I was aware that there were conversations going on with the, uh, the WRU. Were you aware of a conversation between uh, Vaughan Gethin, Dr Robin Howe and Dr Tracy Cooper of Public Health Wales on the 13th of March about the match and Public Health Wales expressing um, to Mr Gethin significant concerns about that match going ahead? Not to my present recollection. The concerns were not simply that 70,000 people would gather at the Principality Stadium, um, but also that significant numbers of fans would be travelling from Scotland. There would be crowding in pubs and bars in Cardiff before and after the match. And the inquiry understands that ultimately it was left to the Welsh Rugby Union to take the decision whether or not to postpone that match. And that decision was taken at lunchtime on the 13th, so that was the day before the match. By that time, 20,000 Scottish uh, rugby fans had already arrived in, in Cardiff. And Mr Davies's evidence to the inquiry is that it would have been reckless to allow the match to proceed. Um, do, you, do you agree it would have been reckless to allow that match to proceed? Well, I had already been arguing Cobra for the match not to go ahead. So you know, my position was it would be preferable for the match not to happen. But I had no uh, medical evidence to, that I could make to support that uh, conclusion. I had no agreement from the UK government to that uh, position and I have no legal power actually to enforce that decision because the power lies exclusively with the Welsh Rugby Union. Um, I had a conversation as you might be about to say Mr Poole, sorry if I'm anticipating you uh, directly with uh, Mr Davis. Uh, this was a, I think, I think one thing we've missed in this discussion so far is just what a hotly contested decision this was, you know, a rugby match in Wales is never far from the headlines, and it was in the headlines all that week with very, very strongly differing views as to whether or not it should be allowed to go ahead. And what I said to Mr Davis in my conversation with him is that whatever decision the Welsh Rugby Union made, the Welsh Government would back it. There would be no criticism from us of whatever decision he made. If he decided to go ahead, we would not criticise him for doing that because he would be relying on the medical advice that was available to us. If he decided that he wouldn't go ahead, we would support them in that as well. You, you say in your witness statement that you do not believe that the Welsh Government was in a position to absolve the WRU of its own responsibilities. But might it not be said that it was in fact an abdication of responsibility on the part of the Welsh Government, who after all... Had, you had had the debate in COBRA, you knew all sides of the argument, you had not only the scientific um, and medical advice, uh, but you also knew the position that Scot Scottish government were taking. Uh, surely it was a decision, ultimately, that ought to have been taken by the Welsh government. Well, uh, I want to be clear, I don't think the Welsh government had the virus to make such a decision. What we could have been is clear over the Welsh Rugby Union how we thought they ought to exercise their responsibility. Uh, but what basis would I have would I have had for doing that when in front of me I have evidence from the Chief Medical Officer that there's no case for doing so. So you know I while my own view, as I've already expressed it, is that the game should not have gone ahead, uh, if I'm going to convey that to somebody else as the decision maker, I need to know that I've got the ground firm under my feet and I can point to the advice I'm relying on and I would not have been able to do that. And just to, just so I understand um, your, what you say about not having the legal power, not having the virus, um, you accept though that there, is a, there would have been a power under the public health legislation, but you're saying because the medical and scientific advice was not there, that you couldn't trigger the power under that legislation. Is that right? The trigger you have to use is well set out in the 84 Act. It has to be a public health emergency and your response has to be proportionate. That's the test, isn't it? It has to be proportionate. If I have evidence from my medical advisors that this is not the thing to do, I do not know how I pass that test of proportionality. Changing um, topic slightly, but still in the same um, chronological run, we're still mid-March, um, hospital discharge and, and care homes. Uh, the inquiry heard evidence from, on Monday from uh, Vaughan Gethin that on the 13th of March uh, he gave a joint press conference <coughs> uh, 
uh, with you regarding uh, the framework of actions, which included a direction to expedite the discharge of vulnerable patients from acute and community hospitals. It also suspended the protocol, which gives the right to a choice of care home. Uh, how much of this was led by the UK government, or was this a decision taken by the Welsh government in a devolved space, namely uh, health? This is a devolved government decision. It's made in advance of a decision by the UK government for England. Now, as we discussed with Mr Gethin on, on Monday, discharging vulnerable patients to care homes presented an obvious risk that had to be managed. Do you think that the risk of spreading the infection from hospitals into care homes, which obviously contains some of the most vulnerable people in, in Welsh society, was properly managed by the Welsh Government? My lady, I'm, I'm trying to be clear in my own mind before I answer the question. Because I'm here to explain, not to justify. I'm not here to try to defend actions that the inquiry will draw its conclusions. I'm here to try and provide the best information I can about how we acted and why we acted. So I don't want to sound in answering that question as though I'm saying to you, we did everything right and there wasn't a mistake that was made. That, that's not my starting point. I can explain to you why we made the decision that we made. I mean, in fact, in reading a vast number of documents before coming here. In some ways, I think this is best captured of all in Sir Chris Whitty's uh, account of the decision to discharge patients uh, in England, because you know, he makes the point that the risks to very vulnerable people of staying in hospital when they are medically fit to be discharged at a point when hospitals are about to become the epicentre uh, of you know, the most dangerous place you can be uh, then that was not a course of action that had uh, merit. You are discharging people back to their homes. Some people live in care homes, but it is their home, and they are fit to be discharged there, and there are protections that can be put in place to try to manage the impact of the disease when they get there. Uh, at the, that was the line of reasoning that we were following at the time, that... The safest thing that we could do was to remove people who didn't need to be in hospital, out of hospital, given the impact that the disease was about to have <coughs> on those hospital services. And that when people went home, there were precautions that could be taken to try to manage the risks that they would face there. Now, we know it wasn't until the 29th of April that the Welsh Government changed its policy uh, and from that point onward, tested all patients being discharged from hospitals to care settings, irrespective of whether they displayed symptoms. Should that decision have been taken earlier than the 29th of April? If it had been taken earlier, then the corollary of that decision would have been that the tests that would have been used for that purpose could not have been used for another purpose. At this point, there are a limited number of tests available for all the different things that the Welsh Government might have applied those tests to achieve. Our decision was to use them in the first instance for frontline staff in hospitals and the choice was not to add another purpose to the list. Had you added that purpose, you would have had to have displaced another purpose. There weren't enough tests to do all the things we would have liked to have done with them. And we were creating a priority uh, order, and that's the debate that lies behind that decision. Obviously, the, the issue didn't, um, didn't begin and end with, with testing on discharge. We, we know that the reason Wales's care homes had such poor outcomes during the first wave of the pandemic was due to infections actually being seeded in the homes through staff. And, and we know that the UK government announced on the 28th of April mass testing of asymptomatic residents and staff across all care homes in England. Two days after that, uh, a group of UK MPs wrote to you expressing their concerns about Wales's failure to do so. Uh, what steps did you take in response to that letter? Well, my lady, I think this is terribly difficult territory because I know just how powerfully people feel 
about what happened in care homes here in Wales. And, you know, I absolutely regret everything uh, that led to loss of life. My own mother lived in a care home in Wales throughout this pandemic. You know, these are matters that, in a Welsh context, decision makers are not immune from the decisions that we take. But the evidence, I think, is the evidence Mr Poole has just cited, that of course there are instances where coronavirus is seeded into care homes by people being discharged from hospital. But the primary reasons why coronavirus ends up in a, in a care home is because of the necessary ingress into care homes of people who are there to care for people in them. And as coronavirus rises in the community, the risk that it will be carried into the care home in that way increases. And you know, I know for lots of people that's an uncomfortable, um, uncomfortable conclusion, but I think it is where the evidence that I have seen takes us. Uh, once we had received, you know, we are receiving <coughs> letters and advice and suggestions from all sorts of people all the time. Uh, what we had was, I hope, I believe at the time, an orderly and predictable way of making decisions in which advice comes to ministers very regularly from people who are focused entirely on this matter of how to try to keep care homes safe, what we can do to enhance uh, that. And I can't be buffeted by letters that want me to do something different over here or something else over there. I have to rely upon the orderly decision-making approach that we have laid down. And as ministers get advice, you can see over March and certainly through April how our approach to care home testing and the protection of people who lived in that vulnerable setting, how that develops. On the 2nd of May, Mr Gethin made an announcement that the evidence does not support blanket testing of staff and, and residents in the UK. Exactly two weeks later, on the 16th of May, he then made a further announcement that everyone in care homes in Wales would be able to get a coronavirus test. Now, the inquiry has heard evidence um, from some scientists that they had the science to support blanket testing since at least the 27th of March. How, in light of that, can you account for the delay until the 16th of May when blanket testing was, was um, introduced? Well, if I could, I'd like to make, you know, from what seems to, from my point of view as the First Minister, an important point. It's a contested point, but my view all the way through, and I had to convey it sometimes to my colleagues, is that the Welsh Government cannot pick and choose the scientific advice that it gets. There are a plethora of scientific voices out there, and you know, they don't agree either. The Welsh Government has a route to the advice that we receive. We receive it through TAC, through our Chief Medical Officer, through the Chief Scientific Advisor. And what we mustn't do as politicians is to say, I like your advice on this topic, and I don't like your advice on that topic. So I'll pick and choose. I'll decide when I like your advice and when I don't like it. Uh, so yes, of course, there are other people who take a different view and say they've got evidence that would lead you in a different direction. But as a politician, as a decision maker, I think that is a very, very slippery slope. And I was very determined not to go down that way of decision making, and as I say, advise my colleagues of that from time to time. Sometimes we didn't agree. I could have told you around the table, we did not always agree with some of the things that we were being advised. But I wasn't prepared to go down a path in which we substituted our lay judgment for the judgment of the professional people who were charged with giving us that advice. We followed the advice that we had through the established routes of providing us advice while being aware. You know? I thought very hard at one point about an invitation that I received to go to a meeting with Independent Sage. And in the end, I decided not to go there. Not because I am not naturally curious, you know, from my own background in hearing different points of view. But I decided that I couldn't do that, that that would undermine the relationship we had with the Sage on which we had to rely. So that, that's... I wanted to make that slightly general point because it was a fundamental part of the way that we approached this dilemma of 
somebody says this, somebody else says that, why didn't you follow? Uh, we followed the advice of the people who were charged with giving that advice and didn't pick and choose between it. But supposing they gave you advice, say, let's take lockdown as an example, it's the most controversial um, NPI. So supposing you have advisors who say, right, you've got a lockdown and you are conscious of all the impacts of lockdown on people. We all know that they spread far and wide, um, mental health, children's development, education, everything. Um, by just following your expert, who happens to be in the pro-lockdown camp, um, you're never listening to an expert who may say, well, wait a minute, lockdown is not necessary. So, for example, those who signed the Great Barrington Declaration. So did you deny yourself the alternative argument? Well, not in the sense of not being aware of it, because these things are widely reported and widely debated. But... Imagine if we had. Imagine if we had said, well, the advice to the Welsh Government from our Chief Medical Officer, not just him, by the way, but all four Chief Medical Officers, is that we should do that. But we'd rather take the advice of somebody else, who we fancy their advice a bit more. <coughs> what, a, what an unravelling of decision-making follows from that. You know, as I say, it's a, it's a, from my point of view, it's a terrifically slippery slope to allow yourself to do that. But you can't, can't you justify that approach by saying, right, well, I've heard this advice pro-lockdown, I've heard this advice anti-lockdown, I'm now going to balance all the factors, which as a decision-maker you have to do, so you balance the socio-economic factors as well as the scientific evidence, and say, on that, balancing all the factors, I'm going to go for the advice from an outside source. I would not have been prepared to do that. Right. I think that would have unravelled proper decision-making inside the Welsh Government very, very quickly indeed. It's, uh, once you take that first step, you've undermined your ability, I think, to conduct government in the way that government should be conducted. Thank you. I suppose it follows, does it, Mr Drake, from what you've just said, that it is therefore crucial to ensure that you have a range of opinions at your disposal within your structures that you are taking advice from. So, for example, SAGE or SPIM or TAG and TAC. Is that right? Of, of course. The, the fact that we, in the end, have a single piece of advice because you've got to make a decision. So, you know, there's, there's a fork in the road. You've got to decide which way you've got. That does not mean that behind that final piece of advice. There is not a wide variety of views and a lot of sharp debate as well. And of course, you want to have that. That's, that's very important. I think you see that played out in the minutes of those bodies. But in the end, that has to crystallise in a choice between the, the two, if it is a binary choice, between the two courses of action you could take. Change topic slightly, but staying hopefully chronologically, we now move to the 18th of March. Um, the decision was taken in Wales on the 18th of March to close schools in Wales early for Easter. Uh, was that a... I think you might have answered this right at the outset um, when I gave you the example of ministerial decisions within their own portfolio. But was this a consensus decision taken by Cabinet or was this a decision taken by the then Minister for Education, Kirsty Williams? Um, important to say, of course, it's not a decision. Welsh Government does not have decision-making uh, capabilities. It's advice that is given to those who have decision-making. Uh, this is a decision that is made under enormous pressure of unravelling events. Uh, I answered questions on the floor of the Senate on the 17th of March, and I firmly repeated the position of the Welsh Government, which is that we did not want schools to close before, before Easter. By the end of that afternoon, we are already getting reports of schools closing in many parts of Wales, either as staff fall ill and cannot be in the classroom, or as parents withdraw their children of their own volition. I, I think something we haven't touched on at all here, but comes home very powerfully to me in rereading the papers, is just the degree of fear there is amongst people at this point. People are really afraid, and they are afraid that sending their child to school is putting that child at risk. Between 
the evening of the 17th of March and the end of the morning of the 18th, I think I met the Education Minister on at least six different occasions as the evidence accumulated through the day that more and more schools were just closing around us and at least one education authority is now saying to us it will close all the schools in its area. We are also getting powerful pleas from the Welsh Local Government Association of Teacher Unions for the Welsh Government to try to put some order around what we see happening in front of us so that parents and teachers and others have a sense of schools coming to an orderly end. And by the end of the morning, that is what the Education Minister and I have concluded. There is no opportunity at this point for the whole Cabinet to be gathered around that decision. But, as I say, we are not deciding to close schools. In many ways, what we are doing is trying to put some sense of order around a series of events that are happening beyond our direct control in any event. And is it, therefore, your, your evidence that closing schools on the 18th of March is really something that could not have been avoided at that point in time? It was happening already. It was happening in front of our eyes. What we wanted to do was to try to make that system predictable, communicable to parents uh, and staff, and then to take action immediately to put in place alternative arrangements for those vulnerable children and children of key workers who we knew would still need to be able to attend school. On the evening of the 20th of March, you announced that the Welsh Government would use public health powers to close restaurants, pubs, bars, other facilities where people gather. Uh, the inquiries heard evidence that on the 22nd of March, there was then a meeting between uh, yourself, Secretary of State for Health, health ministers from the devolved administrations, obviously including also Mr Gethin. And you say that one of the actions that arose from that meeting on the 22nd uh, was to prepare a lockdown plan. Would I be right to infer from that that at that stage, 22nd of March, that there was no plan as such for a Welsh lockdown? What I think you see there is that for the first time, I am agreeing that we need to think of a Wales-only lockdown plan. This is the 21st and the 22nd of March, our weekend days. We're meeting right through the weekend. We're meeting on the 22nd. As you say, the Cabinet meets in full at the end of the 22nd. And I have been told that there will be a COBRA that day. That I'm expecting to attend a COBRA and I'm expecting the Prime Minister to propose that there will be a UK-wide lockdown. When the COBRA doesn't happen, I'm now beginning to wonder why it hasn't taken place. And I'm bound to have some anxiety that it may be because the Prime Minister isn't going to agree to that course of action. So at this point, I ask for legal advice and policy advice as to what we, what we would do if we were in the position of having to do that alone. I think it's highly improbable that we would have been able to do it, and I think there were very large barriers in our path. But given that we might have to face it, and over that weekend, I ask for that advice. On the 23rd, of course, we have a COBRA meeting, and it transpires that the proposal is for a UK-wide lockdown, so I don't need to act on any of that advice. But on a precautionary, it may be necessary basis, that advice is uh, commissioned. You have said in your evidence that your perception is that the actual decision to lock down was taken by the UK government shortly before the COBRA meeting that you attend on the 23rd of March. Is, is that right? Well, it, th that is an impression, so I mustn't put any more weight on it than that. But um, we were not getting indications earlier in the day, as you sometimes would, that, you know, this meetings are happening, decisions are being made, this is the direction of travel, this is what you should expect when you come to the meeting at five o'clock. My impression was is that the... So I'm going to use you another football analogy now. You know, the ball was still in the air until quite late in the day. And obviously you, you attend that COBRA meeting on the 23rd of March. Um, at that stage, you, you all knew that there was exponential growth. 
once control had been lost, the virus would be rapidly spreading. Now, notwithstanding that understanding, the four governments had introduced measures previously on, this, on the 16th of, um, 16th of March to try and control the spread and slow the spread of the virus. Why weren't those measures given longer to, to work prior to imposing lockdown on the 23rd of March? Because I think the evidence was too vivid uh, that insufficient numbers of people were complying with the decisions that had already been taken. That was the anxiety. I received, my lady, reports over that weekend of the 21st and 22nd of March. It was a beautiful weekend. Barry Island, I saw a note, is rammed. Uh, beaches in Llanelli are overflowing. Penavan, which is a tourist hotspot in Wales, has got hundreds and hundreds of people gathering and walking up and down the mountain. You know, the evidence was there already that the measures we had agreed only a few days before were not being observed with sufficient consistency to have the impact that we know we needed to extract from them. Do you consider then by the 23rd of March a national lockdown was absolutely necessary? Uh, that was my view, but I was confident that it was the view of my Cabinet colleagues as well. We'd met on the Sunday, we'd met on the Monday, we'd been rehearsing all of these arguments. Although the decision on the spot was a decision I had to take on behalf of Wales, I was entirely confident that this was what my Cabinet colleagues would have wished to have supported. Had different decisions been made leading up to this point on the 23rd of March, do you think there is a chance that lockdown could have been avoided? Well, we are entirely in the realms of speculation here. My own speculation is that lockdown would have happened and should have happened earlier. Not that it would have been avoided, but the timing of it would have been altered. And when should the UK have locked down, in your view? Well, I'm, I'm an amateur witness uh, on this matter. I've seen what other people have said. I don't have any reason to dissent much from what seems to me a fairly you know, broad consensus that uh, it could have happened a week earlier than it did. I want to next look at the period following the implement implementation of national lockdown up to the uh, autumn of 2020. <clears throat> now, as we know, imposing the lockdown in Wales using public health powers meant that there was a legal duty to review uh, the need for restrictions and uh, requirements every 21 days. Uh, early April, you were pressing the UK government to convene a COBRA meeting in good time before the 16th of April, which was that first 21-day review uh, date so that the Four Nations could discuss a further set of coordinated announcements. If we could please have a look at INQ 30256826. Uh, this is a letter written um, by all of the uh, devolved administrations to the Prime Minister on the 4th of April. If we can have a look at the uh, first paragraph, it refers to uh, Mr Johnson's recent COVID-19 diagnosis. Now, we know that on the 27th of March, uh, it was made public Mr Johnson had tested positive for COVID. He was later admitted to hospital on the 6th of April, where he remained for six days. Uh, you have said in your evidence that Mr Johnson's illness and hospitalisation did have an impact on decision-making. You describe it as having had a chilling effect. Um, it, just describe to us in what way you say that um, Mr Johnson's illness and hospitalisation had an impact on decision-making in the way you describe could I say, to begin with, that I have no complaints at all about the way in which meetings in the absence of Mr Johnson were conducted by Mr Raab, who chaired those meetings. He was a good chair uh, of a meeting. The chilling effect is in the hesitation which the whole system feels about making major decisions when the Prime Minister himself is not at the table and not able to participate in them. So, to my mind, you could... You, you could detect very easily the hesitation that was there amongst people who were left to make those decisions in the absence of the Prime Minister. We can have a look at the third paragraph, please, of this letter. Um, 
you say, uh, picking it up, where, whereas hurriedly convened COBRA meetings early in the pandemic were understandable, there is no reason not to ensure an orderly process ahead of this predictable milestone. Did you find it surprising that you and the other um, First Ministers um, were having to write to the Prime Minister in, in this way on the 4th of April? Well, I think it, it, it does illustrate some of our anxieties that a regular, reliable rhythm of engagement at that level had been put in place. A few days after this letter was sent, you describe in your evidence a call with Mr Gove on the 8th of April, uh, but you say there was no commitment being given on behalf of the UK government to hold a COBRA meeting. Uh, you must have been somewhat surprised then to receive a calling notice at um, 10 to 7 that evening to attend the COBRA the following day. Um, that was chaired by Mr Raab. It's the COBRA meeting of the 9th of April. If we can have a look at INQ 4083830, please. Um, of these minutes, you've said in your evidence that they accord with your recollection that, uh, your words, a consistent message was required across the four nations to ensure the message landed in the most clear way. And I think, in fact, we see that noted if we have a look at paragraph 5, page 3 there. Uh, now, in the, in the Welsh Government, this is Cabinet Office uh, minutes, but in the Welsh Government notes of this meeting, you are recorded as saying... Our clear message is that people stay home and restrictions remain in place. We are not throwing away everything we have gained. W were you concerned at this stage that the UK government might not be on the same page as the Welsh government and the, the devol other devolved administrations and also the Mayor of London? Well, if I was concerned, um, then events prove me wrong because the UK government does agree that a further uh, three weeks of the same level of restrictions is necessary. I probably do have some anxiety as to whether or not they share uh, that view, but more importantly, in practice, when we had that COBRA meeting, there was a continued Four Nation agreement that the level of intervention that we've seen in the first three weeks must continue for another three weeks. You refer in your witness statement to a Four Nations phone call with the Prime Minister on the 7th of May. Uh, you say that the UK government's roadmap adopted a different approach to the approach that the Welsh government was uh, taking. Just want to explore what you mean by this by reference to some minutes of an ex-COVID meeting on the <laughs> 7th of May. Uh, it's INQ 00021649. Uh, please. And if we look at the, in the middle of the page, the permanent secretary has noted as reporting that he had been told by his counterparts in the UK that the view in Westminster was that the population was over complying with the work from home message and were overlooking the part of the message which said it cannot work from home, so work at home, then you should go to work and practice social distancing. Uh, reportedly, the prime minister wanted to correct the over compliance and was concerned about the economic outlook. And then there was discussion at this meeting on the 7th of May as to whether to retain the stay home, save lives messaging. If we just have a look at the bottom of page two, please, of these minutes, we see Toby Mason's uh, comments, this absolutely not just messaging, but a policy difference, and notes that if Wales retains stay at home, it will be different to England, who were looking to ease some restrictions to allow activity outdoors. Now, in terms of the stay home message, you say in your evidence, Mr Drakeford, that changing policy from stay at home to stay alert was not something that you could and would support. Can you just explain why, uh, given that the UK government and the Welsh government uh, were drawing on the same scientific evidence, uh, you didn't feel able to support the UK government's change of policy? Well, having said at the start of my evidence that you know there was always more that we agreed on than we disagreed on. This was one of the bleaker moments uh, during the conduct of intergovernmental affairs. Um, I'm not part of the meeting that you've just quoted here, but I do go to a COBRA meeting on the 10th of May. And I hear for the first time that the UK government intends to abandon the message that we've all agreed on and to move away from stay home 
to stay alert. I'm hearing it in the meeting, and this is one of those examples when I feel that the decision has already been made. We're not, not really being asked to participate in whether to move. We're being told the UK government has decided to move. I hear from the head of communications in the UK government, someone whose advice I'd heard many times and you know, respected a lot, that there have been focus groups carried out around this change of messaging, none of which we either knew about, we didn't know they'd happened, and we certainly had no access to the results of them. And I simply was not prepared to agree to such a major change of policy on the basis of the information that I had in front of me at that meeting. I was very unconvinced by stay alert. I have no idea what stay alert is asking me to do. No. Well, my advice to a Welsh citizen is stay at home. Well, they know what I'm a what's being asked of them. If I'm asking them to stay alert, I have no idea what it is that they are expected to do in response to uh, that injunction. So, for all those reasons, no prior notice, no sharing of the basis on which the change had been made, no ability to explain to me what the new message was meant to convey to anybody. I wasn't prepared to agree to it. I had no cabinet cover for doing that because we never, we didn't know that we were going to be asked to agree. So at that meeting on the 10th of May, I make it very clear that if the Prime Minister decides to go ahead in that way, then he must be very clear that this is a decision he is making for England and that in Wales we will continue with the mantra that we have very successfully persuaded people to stay with uh, in those first six weeks. And I th think it would be fair to say that the announcement that's made, we've seen the text of it with, with other witnesses, um, there's very little in that announcement made by Mr Johnson to suggest that these measures apply to England only. Um, did that cause confusion in Wales? Yeah, I think it's the opposite of there not being much to convey that there is a difference. And I'm doing my best not, you know, only... Um, not to sound as cross as I felt at the time, perhaps. But in that COBRA meeting, we have a very direct rehearsal with the Prime Minister of the need for him to be clear in a press conference, which he's told us he's about to have, so we know the decision's made, because he's got a press conference lined up to announce it. In that press conference, he must make it clear that what he's about to say does not apply in Wales or Scotland or Northern Ireland. And he gives assurances in the COBRA meeting that he will do his very best to make sure he does that. He then heads to the cameras and he, set, he provides uh, a script in front of the cameras in which the only time he refers to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland is when he says early in the press conference, as Prime Minister of Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland. It is a very clear indication to people that what he's about to say applies to the whole of the United Kingdom. And he never once says that that is not the case. That's why I describe it as a bleak moment, because this is not a moment when, and I, you know, I understand that people can use Britain, Northern United Kingdom, England interchangeably, if that's the way they've been brought up. Uh, but in this case, this is not a slip of the tongue. This is not somebody forgetting to mention this is a deliberate attempt to imply to people that what the Prime Minister is about to say means them when he full well knew that he didn't. And I think the following day, the 11th of May, you, you give a press conference making some of the points you've just made and we'll come to that after the break. Certainly. Quarter to two, please. All rise.